and it doesn't get resolved in the first few pages. I thought my worries and issues were just going to go away the moment I opened this volume, but sure enough, nope. We're just going to drag this out. <laughs> we're just going to frustrate Andrew for as long as possible. Happy Mushoku Mondays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another trek through Mushoku Tensei Jabba's Reincarnation novel series. We're on volume 21, chapter 1. And yeah, definitely a great first two chapters. Unfortunately, left with another cliffhanger at the end of chapter two, and I think this is going to pretty much cover Mashoka Monday. But we'll see, as always. As per usual, greatly appreciate you guys' support. Thank you for dropping by for the premiere. Hey to everybody that dropped by for the VOD later on. Hope you guys are doing well. Greatly appreciate your guys' support, your kind words, all the ways that you guys support the channel, especially monetarily through Patreon, tips, links, super thanks, memberships. It means a great deal to me. But yes, Infernal Torch with a super last week and Roy's Moist with a super. Thank you guys so much for your support. But yes, with that said, let's just get into it. Let's just jump right into it because we got a lot to go through. But yes, chapter one, playing dumb. <laughs> a lot of playing dumb in this first chapter it's like who does this apply to i wonder everybody's playing dumb they arrived in the adventurer's district within 15 minutes rudius practiced this a bunch he rarely botched up his landing from his magic leap anymore no broken legs from this impact i i kind of got that last week it didn't really kind of dawn on me exactly what he was doing there like when he was leaping off i mean it could have been the idea that yes it suddenly it took off or whatever but it could have been like him leaping forward to run there but the moment i realized opening up this volume I'm like Oh, he's doing the jump. And I'm like, nice callback to Sharon, you know, when he first got Aisha and leapt with the with the, the rock pillar. <laughs> and Aisha's just screaming. So now she's getting like PTSD right now. It may have been only 15 minutes in the air, but it had been several hours since Dennis' disappearance. Reus needed to find her quickly. It almost words that in a way that he leapt for 15 minutes. Like he was, he had air for 15 minutes. That's a long leap. As impatient as he was to get going, they needed to think this through. Geese had apparently taken Zenith for a walk. While an S-rank adventurer, he was no good in a fight, and everyone knew how demon folk were treated in the holy country of Millis. He could pass for a beast folk, so he could avoid some abuse, but it was possible for a city guard to get the wrong idea, and arrest him for kidnapping a mentally impaired woman. Then there was the issue that might arise if the Latria family spotted a demon with Zenith. Who knew what Claire was capable of? He needed to get Zenith under his protection as soon as possible. Let's get going, Aisha. W wait a second, big brother. Aisha sank to the ground. Her legs were shaking so badly, her knees were knocking together. <laughs> Poor girl. She seemed too weak to stand. There's no time, come on. Okay, but can we at least lock on the ground? So she didn't like heights. That was his mistake. I don't think it's really heights. It's the fact that you're launching across the world. <laughs> he seemed to be surrounded by people who are bad with heights. I don't know if they've ever implied people being bad with heights before. Sylvie was terrified of high places, and Reese wasn't keen himself. Edis probably liked them, but he needed to stay on focus. If we run along the ground, we'll cause a traffic accident. Come on, let's go find Zenith. <laughs> I can't walk. Fine, I'll give you a piggyback ride. You're not going to fly? I won't. He hoisted her onto his back. How about checking the taverns, big brother? It's dinner time. Maybe they went out to eat somewhere. Oh, good idea. Following her suggestion, they jogged along, peering into taverns. Everywhere was packed with a dinner crowd, but you didn't have to inspect every single customer like an idiot. They limited questioning to staff to cut down on time spent at each location. One of them had to have seen a vacant staring woman and a monkey-faced demon. Finally, he got the lead at the third tavern. Someone had seen geese at the Dapolite Tavern. However, they hadn't seen a woman with him. The moment I read that, a gut punch, gut punch the moment I read that. Because <laughs> the guy specifically says he knows geese. After paying the bartender with a thanks, Rudius hurried off. He had a real bad feeling. The Dapolite Tavern was in a bad part of town. Luring men swaggered along, eyeing the women who loitered in the streets. Rudius was pretty sure they were prostitutes, meaning they weren't far from the Pleasure District. It seemed even Milshin had one, apparently. Yeah, I think with a place that big, but it is kind of a shock that that would be something that would be present. You think they would have like a, a stronger handle on what was in the town? The men were looking at Rudius and Aisha. They were probably too vanilla to blend in there. Haha, <laughs> well, hey kid, you kind of play then? One of them struck a conversation with Rudius, and while he was always striving to up his game, they weren't in bed right now. That was the weirdest reply that I've ever seen Rudius do to the random dude in the street. Some guy asking him something like that, and he's like, yeah, I'm always looking up my game, but I'm not in bed right now. Like, I mean, Rudius could be wanting to try it with a guy, I don't know. I ain't gonna judge. Big, big brother, put me down. This is embarrassing. Apparently, they were just intrigued by how Aisha was clung on his back. Once he put her down, they stopped staring. Again, it's so, this, is a, <laughs> this section's so weird. Again, Lurdius responding that way, and then, like, because he put Aisha down, they all stopped looking at him. It's a, I don't know, this might be, I'm wondering if this is a bad translation, because this sounds so weird. Like, you would think if they're, like, in a bad side of town, like, a place with, like, prostitutes and stuff like that, yeah, I can assume the guy's talking to Aisha. Maybe the guy wants to talk to Aisha, or maybe he's looking to two-man with Aisha or something like that. I can see that. 
But why would him putting her down immediately make them all stop watching? Oh, they're piggybacking. Aw, it's just a girl on his back and he put her down. It's just, it sounds weird. I'm sorry. They had arrived at the Doppel Light Tavern. It looked pretty standard, but patrons coming in and out were a seedy crowd. Long ago, the scowl on the face of a man leaving the establishment would have scared Rudius Witless. Since coming to this world, though, he'd grown tough. Now he could even walk fearless into a place like this. Honestly, the Rukwag Mercenary Band office in Shariah was more intimidating. Still, he didn't think about Zenith being in a place like this. Yeah, even the Rukwagmar Mercenary Band, he was walking in there looking pretty <laughs> shaken. He tried to be tough, though. Still, he didn't like thinking about Zenith being in a place like this. What the hell was Geese thinking? Rudius liked the guy, but if he had gotten confused and tried to sell Zenith to a brothel or something, he'd never forgive him. He'd take both of his arms and legs. The barkeep gave off a spirited greeting that carried over the tavern shatter. The tavern might have looked shady from the outside, but inside was friendly, and Rudius didn't get a feeling that he was an outsider here. The patrons weren't all rough types either. There was plenty of ordinary looking adventurers too. And then this is the real clever bit. I said, I reckon all three teleportation circles are trapped, and there's another path. Dude's still in Rudius' whole idea there. He's he's Jack and Rudius' story right there. Rudius recognized a voice in the back of the room. A monkey-faced man was throwing back drinks and boasting to young adventurers. His companions were a boy with spiked up hair, one with long hair and a nose piercing, and a girl with slightly slanted eyes and hair dyed unnatural color. Geese was looking like an old poser, and Zenith wasn't there. Looking around the room, she was nowhere to be seen. Then, just like I had suspected, we damn well found one. A secret passage to the boss's room. Approaching the table, Geese noticed Rudius. In a split second, his expression changed to one of horror. This is the telling part. This is such, this is the massive telling part. The moment he sees Rudius, he freaks out. Again, we'll find out here in a minute. He, he's supposed to return Zenith, so it's like, why would he be scared right now? Geese. Hey, boss. I was, uh, I was just talking about you. Now, it could be, yes, that he's stealing a story, but horror? <laughs> you lot, this guy here is Quagmire I told you about. The other three gaped at him. The girl even pressed her hand against her breast and leaned back in her chair. It made Rudius wonder what he had told him about him. <laughs> Rudius had a mountain of questions for Geese. But first, he may want to lure him into telling him about the man-god if he was involved. Geese, I didn't want to believe it. You, my enemy? Eh? Say what? He told you everything, right? Visit you in a dream? Told you what I'd do now? Dream? What are you talking about? Geese gave off a nervous laugh. He was deflecting. Reese pointed his finger at Geese, concentrating his magic. Once the stone cannon formed, it began to spin rapidly like a drill. The buzzing reverberated around the room. Young adventurers, eyes wide, stood from their chairs. Stay where you are. Everyone stopped. Looking at Geese's eyes, Rius asked again, What words did he fill your head with? Tell me everything, and I'll let you live. Whoa, whoa, hey, 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 c c cut it out. I I'm sorry. I, I don't know what I did, but it wasn't my fault. Now, get that thing away from me. Drawing his finger back a little bit, Geese jumped from his chair and threw himself at Rius's feet. Without a hint of dignity, he groveled and apologized. Looks like I really messed up. I'm sorry I made you mad, but I, I, I mean, Rudius, look, see how sorry I am? I don't know what I did. Can you just tell me that? So I can apologize properly? You gotta forgive me. This caught Rius off guard. It wasn't a reaction he expected at all. Maybe he wasn't serving the man god. No, it was too early to know for sure. Even with a small niggling doubt, Rius felt bad seeing his longtime companion groveling. Where's my mother? Huh? Geese looked up with his head tilted to one side. The expression on his face, red with drink, was one of bewilderment. If he was acting, it was a great performance. He's a good performer, yeah. I could see him being a really good performer. <laughs> My mother, Zenith Grey Rat. Zenith? I just showed her around for a bit, then took her home. She's not at the house. That's why I'm here. Rius crossed his arms before one of the boys snickered. Rius noticed that Aisha was standing beside him, mimicking his pose and nodding. <laughs> it was just a family resemblance. Neither of them were in a mood to joke. After Rius glared at the boy, he froze the tiny squeak. What had Beast been telling the people about him? Huh, but uh, here now. I definitely took her home, you know? Where'd you leave her? Where? Well, you know. The entrance to the adventure district. A servant from the house came to get her, so I left her with them. A servant? Their servant? Cliff and Reese had been at the church's headquarters. Aisha had been shopping. And Wendy had been at the house. No, wait. He wasn't talking about Cliff's house. Someone from the Latria family. Yeah, yeah. I checked their coat of arms properly and all. They were Latria servant. No doubt about it. Reese's pulse quickened. Zenith had been taken back to the Latrias. <laughs> he had to calm down. Get his thoughts in order. First things first. Geese had taken Zenith out. But why? What were you doing taking my mother out of the house in the first place? I didn't mean anything by it, boss. It's just been a while since I saw your mother, so I wanted to catch up, that's all. See, this is the this was the thing I was talking about last volume, 
um, about how I just don't know Geese. I, I honestly, he's been kind of a wild card for me. I mean, granted, most of the characters, you don't get a full perspective of them. You don't know. We don't get full, like, entire chapters given to their perspective all the time. It took forever for us to even get a sense of who, what, what Zenoba was thinking. And Geese is in that, that position right now where I just don't know what he thinks about people. I don't know how much he cares about his old band of party members. I don't know how much he cares about Zenith. I don't even know if he, if he was upset about Paul dying. I just don't know this guy yet. I don't know if he's a family guy. I don't know if he cares about, you know, Rudius and his family. I don't know if he has a semblance of, uh, of morales in his head. Again, assuming that chapter that we had a while back of somebody drunk talking to the man god, assuming that's Geese, doesn't sound like he's too care. He's that broken up about possibly going against Rudius. Like almost like, uh, you owe me, boy. That's that's it. Like even the sense that you're he's going to be working for this this mysterious figure that sat down next to him against Rudius, who is the son of his old party members Zenith and Paul. Doesn't seem like he's too broken up about it. And honestly, right here where he's talking about, I want to catch up with Zenith and everything. Catch up how? You know what state she's in. What are you going to do catch up with? Are you going to talk to her? I mean, yes, hanging out with her like old times is going to be fulfilling to yourself. But taking her out of the house to go walk around in the, the town to catch up with her? How? She's not talking. You're not like you're going to get updated on what her current situation is by her. If you want to get caught up on her, you're going to talk to her caretakers. They're the ones going to tell her what she's doing. Not to say that you can't hang out with her. And again, you had that opportunity back there when you were on Begrit, and it never gave us an indication that he even visited Zenith. I don't recall them ever saying that he ever visited Zenith. They stated several people went in that room. And yes, some of them could be checking up on Rudius, could have been checking up on Lilia. I don't recall ever hearing that Zenith, uh, Geese was... But of course, admit, Geese was doing something else at the time, and something that was extremely beneficial to everybody. He was going down to get the loot out of the dungeon. Which was a good thing. And even Rudius acknowledged. Yeah, that was kind of messed up that everybody's, you know, mourning and he's getting loot. But that's a good thing. We're going to need that. Especially for Zenith. We're going to need that for Zenith. So it's actually a good thing he did that. Anyways. But he's a he's a massive... He's a massive... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be very interested in when they finally do get into if or whatever involvement. Maybe possibly getting a Geese chapter. That would be go uh, uh, good as well. Again... One that specifically says it's geese, and we're not. I'm not not making this this uh, assumption that that's geese. Watch it ends up being like Talhand or something like that. It's not actually geese, <laughs> but I would like a chapter, and to finally get a sense of does he even care? I mean, yes, he's helping. He's gonna be helping Rudius out here in a minute, but it's like, does he really care? And again, I have my predictions that he's getting. He's purposely getting Zenith involved. So it'd been on a whim. That made sense, but something didn't line up. Yes, the fact that. Anyways, I just got on all that. <laughs> How did you know where Cliff lives? Because I went to see the Latrias first. I didn't much like going there, but I thought if you were there to receive me. But they said something came up, and you and Zenith weren't staying there. So that's where I should go. So I came all the way over here. I thought you hated going to the Divine District. That's just because as a demon, you never know when someone's going to jump you for no reason. When you hang around in there, it's not like I'd rather die or something. His excuse sounded weak. Too vague. Part of it was probably the alcohol. But maybe something was eating at him. Causing him to pause. Then it all clicked for Rudius. Yesterday, Rudius let his temper get the best of him at the Latria Manor, and he stormed out. They must have set a tail on him. As they walked home, Ruius was careless, and they found out where he was staying. If the Latrias came over and demanded the Grimoires hand over Zenith, they knew they'd refuse. They were in enemy factions, and current political climate made launching an attack on the Grimoires untenable. Although the demon expulsionists were ascendant at the present, one misstep could mean their downfall. So the Latrias used Geese, a totally ignorant demon dude who had fallen into their hands. Any other day, they'd have driven a creature like him away. But today, they acquired a pawn no one would expect the demon expulsionist to use. They manipulated him into bringing Zenith out into the open. They probably didn't grab her immediately because they were concerned about a bodyguard. But there was no bodyguard. Rudius was out. And so was Aisha. Ultimately, luck was on their side. They took Zenith without resistance. And Rudius expected that they would have no qualms feigning ignorance either. See, this is all too convenient. This is all too convenient. If Rudius is really thinking this is what happened, that is extremely convenient. And it, it kind of falls in, uh, well, but what I'll eventually get into is that, yes, it, it seems like more and more it's solidifying that at least uh, Claire has been tuned into something from the Man God, or at least is trying to fulfill something for the Man God. And yes, like I said, still holding on to the idea that Geese is involved. 
And I think the two of them are kind of working together in this situation. Because if Claire was not working for the Man God, or at least working on a tip or something like that, the idea that Geese shows up at their front door after Rhea storms out and causes destruction and leaves, that she somehow knew that telling Geese to go over there and handle all that stuff was actually going to play out this way, that he'd end up out in the middle of nowhere, nobody else with him just happened to be going out into town so they can get him off the side and then grab uh, Zenith when they're coming back and that Geese would be okay with that. Everything is just playing out way too convenient. Like, this is... This is plot armor to the gold standard if everything played out so conveniently. Yeah, and I think a lot of this stuff is kind of continuously pushing towards the idea that there's a desire for Rius to go. It'd be right in the smack middle of this conflict. Now that they kidnapped Zenith, they just had to hide her. It would be a simple matter to assign her a care to keep a watch on her. Hey, hey boss, what's going on? When the Latrius told you where we were, did they say anything else? Eh? Um, yeah. They said that Zenith must be missing being home, so I should take her out into the city. Just, it just, again, it, if it's too convenient. <laughs> like, it just sounds, you'd have to be an insane mastermind to be able to predict that all this would play out fine. Because how would they know that Reese wasn't going to be there? And that Geese just shows up at the place and goes, yeah, I'm going to take him out, take Zenith out to the, the town. Sure. Yeah, that, that makes sense. How would, you, it just assumes that he would be able to even get her out of the room. Again, with how Rudius was so defensive about what they were going to do to Zenith. It kind of implies the idea that Rudius would be not okay with her going out into the town alone. It wasn't fair to blame Geese. He didn't know any better. Rudius was the one who told him that they were going to Latrius. He said eventually he would go there. That, that's the kind of struggle there. This is another part that kind of skews it a little bit. Is that, I, if I remember correctly, when they first came into Millis and they ran to Geese, they were going to Cliff's place. And I would, I would assume... That Geese would know at least, if he's not involved with anything bad, Geese would at least know where the Latria's home is at. This is a very prominent family. He's going to know exactly where the Latria's family is at. And it, uh, again, it, it confirms it if he went there, so presumably if he went there first, yeah. Rudius said that he was taking Mother to go see her family, but he was going to Cliff's first. So why would Geese immediately think that? So no. He said that he was going to go visit the Latrius, was going to take Zenith to see her family, but he was going to a different district. Why would Geese go there? It doesn't make any sense. And I'm surprised that Ruiz doesn't pick up on that. I'm really surprised about that. Ruiz was the one that told him they were going to Latrius and that they'd be staying there. I don't recall him saying that he was staying at the Latrius. If he thought that they were there, he was unlikely to suspect anything, even when the Latrius welcomed him without their usual harshness. Yeah, and he would know, if anything, they were acting weird. He should know how mean they are. Then they filled his head with their stories. Of course, he ended up their puppet. Yeah, I like how you talk about how clever he is, and how smart he is, and then right here, yeah, he fell for their puppetry. Ruius had been careless. He should have taken Zenith home today. After seeing how the Latrias were, they shouldn't have stayed in Milshin a moment longer. It would have taken some time, but Ruius should have taken her back to their house. Then come back to give the mercenary bands Milshin chapter due attention. It wasn't like he was pressed for time. He'd kept a potential weakness close by, and that was a mistake. They could have sightseen another time. Regret wasn't going to help this late in the game, though. He needed to get Zenith back. Geese. The thing is, having softened a little on him, Ruiz filled Geese in on everything before asking for his help. He had been manipulated, but he wasn't blameless either. Ruiz was pretty sure that he wasn't serving the man-god after his reaction. And they needed every halfway competent ally they could in these circumstances. Geese's face pained after Ruiz finished. You serious? Now I think about it, it was weird how the Latrius told me an address, without making a thing of it, even without you being there to go in between. I just assumed that you cleared it with them, boss. So that's why they said to take her outside. While Ruius was reckless and showed his enemy a weak point, everyone made mistakes, and he gets Zenith back right away. Okay, I'm in. I'll help you out. Thanks. With Geese on board, they decided to head straight to the Latria Manor. Though Ruius was half despairing, this wasn't how they'd get her back. Spoiler! <laughs> Spoiler! I like how Rudius totally just spoils it right here. Eh, just so you know, this isn't how we get her. But that does also spoil that he does get her back. So that's a good thing. So I guess the first chapter does relieve some pain. The manor was dead silent. It was past dinner time now, far closer to bedtime. Rudius had been carrying two people with him, and that slowed him down. Still, he got them there as quickly as possible. Despite getting them there quickly as possible, Aisha looked like she might cry. <laughs> Poor Aisha. You promised. <laughs> you can guess the route they took. They're still up. The lights were still on in the manor, yet no one was at the gate. He wondered if he should yell, but chose instead to bang on the gate. It's Rudius. Is anyone home? If the neighbors complained, it wasn't his problem. 
It was a stretch to say that justice was on his side, but he had probable cause. If the Latrias were behind the kidnapping, they were in the wrong. If they weren't, then the servant Geese met was both an imposter and the real kidnapper. Reese had done his best to cut all ties with his family, but if someone was using their name falsely, that was their problem as well. Still, no one came out. After banging and more yelling, the force bent the gate out of shape. I need to talk with you about my mother. Still nothing. If you don't get out here, I'll beat your gate down. Just in case they didn't answer, he concentrated his magic into his right hand. If they thought this gate would stop him, they were in for a surprise. Whoa there, boss. Hold on. That's not going to end well. That stopped Rudius. <laughs> They're not going to stop me. That stopped me. This situation was getting to him. He was getting frantic. The other day, Claire was insisting on marrying Zenith off and making her have babies, find a partner, hold a wedding, set up a house, have kids. Actually, thinking about the whole time-consuming process, they had time. No need to panic. Nope. As we'll find out here in a minute, yeah, you don't have much time. Again, I think this is all, this is all getting orchestrated. There's something set here that has to be done, and she's getting it done. If he kept his eye on the Latria's movements, they would eventually lead to Zenith. There was one weak link in this lengthy chain of events, though. You just had to zoom in on the having kids link, and there it was. If you got a man and a woman, threw them in bed for about 30 minutes, that was all the time you needed. By the time he found Zenith, chances were high that an egg would have already been scrambled. Okay, Rudy is getting a little bit too... <laughs> you're getting a little bit too graphic here, Rudy. Stop. He wanted to believe that Claire wouldn't be ruthless about her own daughter, but he wouldn't put anything past a hag who would marry off her mentally impaired daughter. That was why they needed to hurry. Even so, breaking down a gate was rash. He could have broken through in one shot with stone cannon, but the bang would garner attention. He didn't know the laws in this country, but most had laws against breaking down gates. <laughs> yeah, typically, you know, in, you know, breaking an injury is usually a bad thing, no matter where you go. If people would call the police, he'd end up a criminal. That would bring trouble to Cliff and the Pope. Doesn't stop the later on what you're thinking about doing. He needed to get a handle on what was happening before he acted. You're right. If I used earth magic to unlock the gate, we could sneak in. Sneak? Where, exactly? A voice came from beyond the gate. At some point, five men and a woman appeared on the other side. Three soldiers, a butler, and an old woman in fine clothes. Whatever do you mean by this? Banging on my gate at this hour. It was Claire Latria. Ruiz went silent for a moment. Had she come after hearing his voice? Or was she lying in wait for him? <laughs> like she knew this was going to happen. She's been standing out there the whole time. Eh, Ruiz will be here soon. I gotta wait for him. Claire, isn't this a bit underhanded? What are you talking about? I'm talking about how you tricked Geese into helping you abduct my mother. Claire looked to Geese and frowned. Abduct your mother? I'm sure I haven't the faintest idea what you mean. I thought you'd play dumb. Roos gave Geese a meaningful look. Geese nodded before pointing at one of the guards. That's the one that came for Zenith. The guard shrugged, trying to look innocent, like he didn't know what they were talking about. Doctrine forbids any of our family fraternizing with demon folks. We would never, ever employ a filthy demon like that. Claire gave Geese a cold look. <laughs> That's a good cover story. Very good cover story. I give her credit for that one. If you believe that Zenith has been abducted, then there ought to be a search party. Perhaps this demon is behind it. I'd like to hear him explain himself in detail. Geese stepped back, grunting in dismay. She meant to shut him up. Then again, if Geese had been murdered tonight, then Ruiz would have never found his way here. It was a good thing he had moved quickly. That is a good point. If if I'm gonna assume, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna take this idea that Geese is not orchestrating this in some way, or at least half, at least doing his part. Then yeah, it's a good thing he didn't end up in a ditch somewhere. But I think the question mark here is like, hey, um, so are you going to do something? Like, she doesn't seem like she's a, like, hey, let's get somebody out there. Where was the last place you've seen her? Let's go search for her. She doesn't care. I mean, the fact that she's not taking action right now after being told that literally your daughter has been kidnapped and she's acting like she's concerned and playing dumb. If she's not taking action right now, that's a sign that she is playing dumb. You're telling me you have absolutely no idea where my mother is? None at all. And even if I did, you cut yourself from this family. I have no obligation to tell you anything. The hag just kept layering on the venom. What was her angle? What good would antagonizing him do for her? It couldn't be that she was actually one of the man god's disciples, could it? He couldn't figure out her deal. Might it also be possible that she didn't know anything? In which case, Geese was lying? Why would he do that? He was a liar, but Ruiz was sure he wasn't the kind to do it to hurt people. <laughs> I hate these comments. No, no, honestly, honestly, even with what I'm about to read here, I don't, I don't remember if there was anything that really kind of solidified it. There is another route. And again, this is what I was talking about earlier. I love that there's like multiple directions this can go. And I, I have my theories on each one of them, but it's not as if each, any one of them is actually solidified. There is a good chance that Claire doesn't have Zenith. <laughs> like there, there is a small side. I do have one theory that Zen, that 
Claire does not have Zenith. She is not in that house. Later on, there's a statement that she is in fact there, but it could be a lie. I love have, I love that kind of aspect. Claire, she hopped through her nose, turning her cold eyes back to Rudius. Yes, Rudius, if you think I'm lying, by all means, go ahead and search the house. She was confident that he wouldn't find anything then, or she already moved Zenith elsewhere. If that's quite all, I must ask you to leave now. You are no longer a relation of the Latrius. Isn't that so? Rudius was silent. He knew that his expression was full of bitterness. He had his prime suspect right in front of him and no way of getting the truth. He had her right here, but he couldn't think of what to say. He was so afraid for Zenith, and yet he'd never get her whereabouts from this woman. The thought came to him at this point. He might as well abduct Claire and force her to speak by any means necessary. Actually, that wasn't a bad idea. He had no evidence, only Geese's word. But if that was really true and Latrius had taken her, no, he had to calm himself. Talking came first. He knew when he came that she'd probably play dumb. Talking would bring out the truth. A person might look unpleasant until you tried talking to them and found out they weren't all that bad. Hadn't he just learned that? Is my mother a relation to the Latria family? She is my daughter. A mother has an obligation to care for her prodigal children. Bullshit. Yeah. That's what you call forcing her to a marriage that she can't consent to? Claire didn't reply. Again, right here, she's solidifying to Rudius. Even though several times before she said, you're no longer affiliated with us. You're not a part of our family anymore, right? You, you left us behind, right? You're not, you're not a Latria. But still right here, she's implying that she has not removed Zenith from her family. Zenith is still a Latria. In her eyes right here in this statement, Zenith is still my daughter. She is still a Latria. So why aren't you going out to look for her? Why are you going to walk back into your house without wanting to search for her? Why aren't you calling for the guards to look for her? Why aren't you asking them to be arrested right in front of you? She's not doing any of that, and she's about to let them leave. That's a surefire sign to me that Zenith's in that building, that she's not concerned right now. I'm her son. My father told me to protect her with my life, and I'm going to honor that obligation. I'll never abandon her, and so long as I'm alive, I'm going to look for her. So please, give mom back. Claire didn't reply. She did, however, look away, as though she couldn't bear Ruiz's gaze. What was that about? Was it doubt? Did some part of her think that what she was doing was wrong? Claire never came across as an awful person when Therese talked about her. There had to be some miscommunication here. Yeah, that's what it was. Ruiz had to restrain himself, talk reasonably, and get her to tell him what she wanted. The guard is here. He was wrong. <laughs> I like this long paragraph of like, oh my gosh, I got it. Now it's communication. Yeah. Never mind. He was wrong. She wasn't averting her eyes, but rather looking at something else. Towards the road, a group of guards were running towards them with lamps raised. If you push any further, I will have you arrested as an intruder. Well, Ruiz glared back at her, this obstinate, heartless old hag. She wasn't listening to a thing he said. He imagined taking her hostage and using her to demand Zenith's return. The gate meant nothing to him. He could smash through it, lift her by the throat, and shout for the others to bring out Zenith. It would be over in less than two seconds, an instant. But would it get Zenith back? He made himself look once more at the old hag's eyes. She didn't look concerned. On the contrary, her eyes seemed to goad him to try it. She couldn't think that Ruiz was helpless. Last time he was here, he'd flown off the handle. While mostly a blur, he heard later that he sent six to seven guards flying. She currently had two guards and two were running towards them. That was significantly less than last time. That aside, she must know that he had no issues using force, yet only this gate was between them. That's a good point. She's got a lot of, a lot of guts right here. Massive amount of guts. And I think that kind of does come from her probably being in a position where she always gets what she wants. And so and thus she's never had anything taken from her. Even when he took Zenith away that first time, it probably didn't concern her too much. It didn't impact her enough. So yeah, it does kind of show a little bit of a little bit of guts here. I could take you captive and make you tell me where Zenith is. Please proceed. If you think that'll get her back. How was she so confident? She knew that he could do what he wanted to. She knew that he got violent when he got yeah. pissed off. Did she not care what happened to her? Why was she doing this? Yeah. He really couldn't read her. Was she trying to make him get violent? In front of the guards, perhaps? And this does kind of, uh, this is another kind of thing that does lead me to, it, it does two of my theories. The first one is the idea that Zenith, that she doesn't have Zenith. She legit doesn't have Zenith. Geese is trying to make Rudius think that Zen, they, ha, they have Zenith. Or, yeah, maybe the servant took her off somewhere else. So Geese gave her to the servant, but servant didn't bring her there. So that would explain why she has a confidence. I literally don't have her. And I'm not going to bend to your threats. I don't have anything to hide. But yeah, if she does have Zenith and she has this much confidence and no fear of him, it does sort of make me believe why she's going through all of this. It could be a massive pride thing 
Like this chick has some massive, massive pride. Or she feels like she is doing something that has been ordained to her from a god. Claire, you haven't received a message in your dream, have you? Excuse me? A message? What are you on about? For a moment, her ice-cold mask cracked as she gaped at him. That was the face of someone who really didn't know anything, much the same as Geese earlier. No, she wasn't a disciple of the man-god either. The confusion vanished in a second. With a dismissive tut, she looked away from Rudius and back at the guards running at them. We're the city guards. From the Cathedral Knights Aero Company, ma'am. Heard there was a disturbance. Is everything okay? Well, officers, these... Thank you. Rudeus cut her off, summoning his last ounce of rationality. I'm done here for the day. Rudeus felt thoroughly defeated as he made his way home. His mind was spinning. He knew that he wasn't thinking logically. Unspeakable rage and frustration broiled inside of him. In the end, he still didn't know where Zenith was. But this conversation with Claire, her tight-lipped expression, and her answer convinced him. Claire had manipulated Geese and kidnapped Zenith. No doubt in his mind. He probably could have handled things better, but still, without bothering to even try to talk things through, she abducted Zenith, then played dumb and snubbed him. Hey, I'm sorry about this. I really screwed things up. No, Geese, it's not your fault. Yes, it is. <laughs> I'm still holding on Geese as his fault. He's not that dumb. Rudius, he's not that dumb. Even if he wasn't the mastermind, even if he wasn't playing his part, he's not that dumb to fall into her trap. You came all the way to the Divine District from a mother, even though you didn't want to. I guess. Geese hadn't done this. He was a pawn in Claire's scheme. The timing seemed a little too perfect, but being in the wrong place at the wrong time was how people end up as pawns. While Rudeus looked the other way, the enemy had been waiting to strike. Geese, can you ask around about my mother? I can try, but it might be tough. Yeah, that's what I thought. Geese was a demon. Passing soldiers eyed him with suspicion for walking down the street. It'd be tough indeed for him to ask around for information in the Divine District. The guards might even throw him in jail. Now, I do want to mention right here, because it's starting to get into my... It's starting to tickle this theory that I've had for a long time. I don't think I mentioned it back during that chapter. The the one that I'm supposing is Geese talking to the man god. I don't know if I talked about it back then, but I do have a side theory, like way back here. And this is kind of a... It could be seen as a stretch. That there's a possibility that Refugian had put that chapter there to create a sense of suspicion around geese. And that there's a chance that that chapter is not chronologically supposed to be there. That that is a future moment. <laughs> the only thing in that chapter that solidifies a timeline is really the fact that it's after the Teleportation Labyrinth. That's the only indication of time that we have is that it takes place after the Teleportation Labyrinth because he specifically mentions, thanks for the help about the Teleportation Labyrinth. Yeah, we just weren't cut out for it. We screwed up. Things kind of took a turn for the worse. My bad, our bad kind of thing. But that's the only indication that we have for a time frame is that it takes place after technically volume 12. Now, he also does mention that it's been a long time since he's seen that kid, which I'm assuming is supposed to be Rudius. So it does sort of imply that there at least has to be a gap since the last time this individual has seen Rudius. But getting into my theory, there's a possibility that that particular chapter doesn't take place until, I don't know, volume 23. That whatever is happening here, this current story arc is actually taking place before that chapter. And it's just placed back there to make you think that Geese right here is currently working for the Man God. Somewhere in that chapter, he specifically says that that kid owes me a favor. And I owe this person, presumably the Man God, a favor. So I'm going to take that guy's side. So why I'm bringing this up is that there is a chance. I do have a small inkling right here that there's a chance that Geese right here is not working for the Man God. And possibly that this might be what he's talking about, that that kid owes me a favor. That in fact right here, he's not working for the Man God, but actually will help Rudius a lot with this situation. So again, I will keep that in mind as I go through these chapters, but that has been a very, very side theory that I've had for a long time. Plus also again, the other theory that that could have been Talhand. <laughs> I don't really think so, but that could have been Talhand. And that does explain why Talhand right now is going back to his hometown. Because again, like mentioned that chapter, whoever was in that chapter talking to the Man God was mentioning that things went bad at their hometown and it was seemingly the Man God's fault. So I will keep that in mind as well. But again, also Geese has problems with his homeland as well. Anyways, back to it. Geese was a demon. Passing soldiers eyed him with suspicion 
for walking down the street. It'd be tough indeed for him to ask around for information in the Divine District. The guards might even throw him in jail. Still, he could be a more subtle kind of help. If the other side was going to play it like that, using whatever tricks he could was fine. From this day on, Rurius Grey Rat was an enemy of the demon expulsionists. Old Claire had herself to thank for that. Aisha, Geese, whatever comes next will be a little dangerous. I'm counting on both of you. Of course, big brother. But what are you going to do? Aisha sounded nervous. We're going to kidnap the blessed child. Oh, an absolute Rudeus face palm moment. This is like, this is like level, this is like the let's go kill Orsted levels of what are you doing, Rudeus? Chill the F out. I'm going to go, I'm going to go right back to that mindset. So all the people that hated me for being completely against Rudeus fighting Orsted. Yeah, you're going to probably hate me for going right back in that realm with this whole situation. It's like. If your go-to right now is to go kidnap the blessed child, then, then do what you were going to do earlier and just kidnap Claire. Even if she won't tell you where Zenith is, she's going to be needed for whatever decision she's making right now with Zenith. They're not going to go through with whatever they're doing with Zenith if she's not there. <laughs> so just go kidnap her. Like if, this, if you're planning on making yourself an enemy of an entire faction, then start with Claire first. Let's not make an enemy of the entire faction. Let's just start with Claire first. It's just like, what? what is your, where is your brain going right now, dude? What? What's with all this crazy talk all of a sudden? You can't, boss. The Elatrias have strong ties to the Temple Knights, and the Temple Knights are with the Cardinal. They maintain their influence through the Blessed Child, meaning the Blessed Child will make the most effective hostage. Anyone else, there'd be a possibility they would sacrifice that piece. But the Blessed Child guarantees we'll get my mother back. And then you're going to make yourself an enemy of the entire country, and they're going to come kill your family. I like that he brings it up finally later on, but it's like, you know how that went. You have a book at your home that tells you exactly how this ends. If you kidnap that blessed child just to use her as a hostage, say you get Zenith back. Look at that book you have back at home and tell me how that ends. In that book, you stole a healing spell. That's all you did in that book. You stole a healing spell. And you're going to tell me that stealing a blessed child isn't going to get your entire family killed, murdered. You know how that went. Think for a second. And yes, I do acknowledge that right now he's not thinking straight. Don't come at me, chat. <laughs> I like how I criticize and everyone's like, but he right now he's not. Yeah, I know. I know. It's what's fun about criticizing Rudius. Rudius' opponent had resorted to kidnapping. And he won an eye for an eye. He couldn't think of any better candidate than the blessed child to use in a hostage exchange. Effective, sure, but what after that? Assuming we get Zenith back safe, we'll turn the whole of Millis against us. Screw the holy country of Millis. With Orsid's brute force and Ariel's political clout, they'd beat them into submission. Rhys had already given up on operating here. Zenith was way more important in his eyes. The fight against the man god mattered too. But what was all that for if he threw away what he loved most? That's some strong, that's some strong love for Zenith moment right here. I love it. Again, I've, I'm... I'm still, I was still up in the air coming into these recent chapter or these recent volumes on where Rudia stood with Zenith as a mother. Again, I'm still hoping eventually we get that Zenith is my mom moment. I am, I am her son. Might be all right with you, boss, but I'm a demon. After all that, before they know I'm involved with you, they'll kill me. The word killed slowed Rudius down a little bit. His head cleared. Keese was right. If he made enemies with the Latrias and the Temple Knights, he wouldn't be just putting himself in danger, but everyone around him. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And they would have an army full of the types that he met earlier that day. Who knew what they were capable of? The Pope would probably be fine, but Cliff would become a major target. In the future diary, Thank you. Brings it up. Aisha and Zenoba have been killed by Milshan knights. If he made Milis his enemy, they wouldn't be safe even back in Shariah. And that wasn't even getting into obstacles. It would almost certainly throw in future progress. The followers of Milis were all over the central continent. They would easily get in their way. There was no reason the Holy Knights of Millis shouldn't be their allies. If they were enemies when Laplace was reincarnated, no one would be happier about that than the Man God. Was kidnapping her even a good move to begin with? Surely the Man God wasn't trying to get Rudius to kidnap the Blessed Child. That was paranoia talking. Again, I, I think there is a move here that seems to be pushing him to being involved with the conflict. Now, what side of the conflict is obviously the massive question mark. It could be either side. And it could be a case of not really caring what side as long as he's involved in the conflict. Then Rudius recalled something. Behind closed doors, the Pope had implied that he wanted to do something about the Pless child and her cardinal supporters. 
if Rudius played things out right, he might be able to get Zenith back while he was bringing down the Latrias and the Cardinal. He wasn't too concerned about coming out on the Pope's side, no matter what he did. If he wanted to sell reserve figurines, he'd already picked a side. Cliff didn't really want him to declare his team yet, but he'd understand. Yeah, that was something that was interesting. I think I seen somebody in the chat mention um, last Mashuka Monday about uh, like things about like Roxy being a key decision maker. That's actually very interesting to point out. Yeah, the assumption is that Rudius would like the idea of of joining the supporters of the uh, inclusionists and not the expulsionists, because yeah, he would one day want to be able to have Roxy walk around in Millis without any sort of issues. But it's interesting that Rudius has never mentioned that. Rudius has never once brought, if I remember correctly, has never once brought up the idea of the ex expulsionists and a concern with Roxy. And again, I think that's mainly because it's out of sight, out of mind. He's not in Millis. He's not bringing Roxy there. He just doesn't care. Right now, the only thing that he cares about is for his current goal is that, yes, eventually he would like to be able to sell reserved figurines there. And thus, that is a key part of it. But he has never said I don't like these guys because I like demons. It is actually very interesting that he has never actually brought that up. It's mostly been around the idea of the Pope, who is Cliff's grandfather, is on that side. So I kind of like them more. The only point that was nagging at Rudius was Therese, the captain of the Blessed Child's Guard. She saved him 10 years ago and again today. This was no way to repay that kindness. Yeah, and this is where I was already thinking. Well, I was thinking about it earlier when he was thinking about what to do next. My mind immediately went to, yeah, Therese. D contact Therese. She already talked about the idea of talking for him. So why not get her to try to figure something out? Aisha, what do you think? Aisha's face was grave, but she looked up when he spoke. I think kidnapping the blessed child is going too far. Right. You're always cool and collected. So I feel like this isn't like you, big brother. Her big brother isn't usually all cool and collected. <laughs> yeah, I thought of the same thing. I was like, yeah, she's, she hasn't seen you when you're really stressed out. Still, if she felt that way, it proved that he really wasn't thinking clearly. At times like this, it was easy to make a bad call. He had to pull himself together, calm down, so he could think. First, was this part of the man god's plan? Right now, it felt like a stretch. Rudius's paranoia seemed to run wild whenever the man god was involved, but the issue at hand was essentially between Rudius and the Latrias. As far as he knew, it was that simple. It wasn't impossible the man god was trying to make him strike against Claire while making him an enemy of the Cardinalist, but that seemed too convoluted. Besides, Rudius had already sided with the Pope, and Rudius already disagreed with the Cardinal position on many things. And right there, it does technically imply that he's doesn't agree with them and the only thing we really kind of pointed out that they do besides yeah a lot of what claire was saying about zenith which could be just like an overall uh, millis thing it could be strictly that the only thing that we've seen that is strictly about them is the expulsionist so it does technically imply there perhaps the man god seen a future of him joining the cardinal but then it would make more sense to pit him against the blessed child or the cardinal someone who would send him on more clearly adversarial path than that with Claire, though Claire would happily act as an in-between for the Cardinal. Even still, he wouldn't find any evidence to prove it. For now, he'd assume the man-god wasn't involved and go from there. It wasn't a good idea to make outright enemies of the whole expulsionist faction at any rate. All right, kidnapping the blessed child is too much. Let's forget that idea. <laughs> yeah, he's not gonna give up on it though. He's not gonna give up on it though. That made it feel less necessary to jump straight into extreme measures. He had the Pope backing him, and even Therese felt warmly about him. If he talked through everything with those two, they might help him. There was other options to try before turning to an all or nothing strategy. That was his whole reason for going to the church headquarters today. He didn't know what that stubborn old hag wanted, but he doubted she'd immediately push Zenith into bed with strangers to clinch things. Yeah, not in the midst of all this. Besides, after a convoluted kidnapping plot, surely she wouldn't move straight into an obvious plan. There are tons of people we can ask for help. Let's begin by approaching as many as we can. The Latrias must have a next move planned, after all. Aisha and Geese looked relieved. He must have sounded sufficiently rational. <laughs> Just in case, though, Geese, I want you to poke around for information on my mother's whereabouts. I know it won't be easy, so you don't have to do it alone. I can pay. Gotcha, boss. And me? What should I do? Aisha squeezed his hand. She probably felt responsible, too. Okay, you go search the building. Use for the mercenary company branch. Huh? You don't want me to look for Zenith? I want to set up a contact tablet, an emergency teleportation circle. It'd be good to ask for Orsted about the man god's involvement here, too. Oh, right. That's true. What about after that? You go back up Geese and searching for Zenith. Got it. Aisha gave a determined nod. This would be tough for a demon like Geese if he were alone. But pair with Aisha, they'd be a force to be reckoned with. Reese felt reassured that they would track down anything, no matter how obscure. One more thing. If it looks like my mother is in real danger, I'll act first and consequences be damned. 
You two should be ready to get away from here, if it comes to that. Okay. I understand. They both nodded resolutely. Next step, he'd head to the church headquarters tomorrow. And that is chapter one. Ugh, so frustrating again. It's like, it, it, it is one of those things like, okay, yeah, there's the assumption. Okay, it's gotta be Geese. Geese totally has her kidnapped somewhere. He's doing something to her. You got, you're hiding her away so that Ruiz does something really bad. And then it kind of shifts over to, no, maybe it's Claire. Claire's doing it. My gosh, it's got to be Claire. Claire's behind this all. But no, is Geese didn't behind all this. What what route is going to take? It, it, again, it kind of creates a bunch of question marks. And again, suspicion's there, but already the mind's going in like three different possible directions. And it's, it's, it's super fascinating. And again, getting into chapter two, it starts to add like three more possibilities, which we'll get into as we go into there. Chapter two, a chess problem. The next day, Ruiz found himself in a little room cut off from the outside world, squared off against the Pope. Cliff was sitting next to his grandfather and was filled in on everything. Your Holiness, I hope I find you well. This was Ruiz's second audience with His Holiness in many days. Despite him having other things on his plate, he still made time to meet. You must be tired, Mr. Rudius. Is it that obvious? Ruiz had spent the night replaying his encounter with Claire, too infuriated to sleep. He must have looked awful. I can't get his voice back. I can't get his, I can't get back into his voice. It is. Am I correct in assuming that that's why you requested today's audience? He acted like he's seen right through Rudius. Maybe he'd already heard what happened to Zenith. That is true, your holiness. My mother was abducted last night. Oh, and by whom? His smile never faltered. That phrasing, Ruiz felt he knew. Could it be that the Pope was pulling strings behind the curtain? He'd hope not. I have my theories. I have my theories. There's a massive question mark at the end of this chapter as to who chirped. Which bird in the flock decided to chirp? The Latrius. Ruiz recounted last night's events before the Pope narrowed his eyes. And now, you wish for my assistance in your investigation? That about sums it up. The Pope twirled his Santa Claus beard before he looked at Ruiz. In that case, I'll need a favor of you. Cliff was baffled. Your Holiness, he isn't here as part of the faction squabble, but as his family. Do you really feel it appropriate to negotiate terms for such a matter? Think carefully, Cliff. The Pope's voice was kind, but chiding. This is a Latria family dispute. I can intervene, but that will mean interfering with another family's affairs. I doubt the Latrias will take kindly to the grimoires getting involved. They will, however, hear me out if I come to them in my capacity as Pope. This is between a mother, her daughter, and her grandson at the end of the day. Also, unless I use that authority, the grimoires would end up owing the Latrias a hefty debt. So the Latrias will have baited a minnow and caught a whale. From the whale's point of view, the bargain needs a little extra something to be worthwhile. That is technically a very true statement. And the idea that this could this could be seen as almost a way of putting the Pope at a great disadvantage. This could push it into the realm that this whole plot is something bigger. A massive scheme that is all trying to puppeteer a lot of individuals. And the idea that somebody could foresee that just the simple task of taking Zenith away will eventually lead to somebody like the Pope wanting to get involved with somebody as unimportant as Rudius. From an outsider's perspective, it's just Rudius. But they know that the Pope can see that Rudius has a very powerful ally, and thus taking this one person zenith will cause all this. Or who knows, it could all be coincidence. <laughs> it could all be coincidence. What would you have me do, Your Holiness? Oh, you say that easily enough, but this is all feeling a little too good to be true. The dragon god's right hand comes to me in distress, seeking aid. What possessed the Latrius to go and make an enemy of you in the first place, hmm? It's a very good question. It's a very good question. After being told that he is the right hand of the dragon god, why would she mess with that? I don't know. Isn't it possible the Latrius don't know who the dragon god is? Why would she ask her butler? Claire looked down on Rudius and Aisha. He could imagine her disregarding Orsid as a backwater deity. <laughs> Another backwater thing. However he might appear, Count Latria keeps himself well informed on what's going on in the world. He wouldn't let anything concerning a warrior of your caliber slip through his net, and he certainly wouldn't dismiss it. So not Claire, but her husband, Carlyle. I haven't been introduced to the Count yet. I suspect that Claire, his wife, may be doing this alone, so she doesn't know anything. Even if she didn't know who Rius was, different people had different views on who counted as important. Rius wasn't a noble, 
nor did he hold an important role in the government. He served under this alleged dragon god, but while Claire may have heard the name, she had no idea who he was beyond that. Bruce had some sort of connection with Ariel, but she didn't know how close his ties were. For all she knew, he was just tossing big names around to sound important. It followed then that in Claire's world, he hardly held that much standing at all. That's true. She could see him as not really that powerful. Even if he did blow away some guards, it's not like it, it's a threat to her. Lady Latria has a tendency to put too much weight into titles and blood. It is true. But what you say is plausible. Well, why not? No risk, no reward, as they say. In which case, Lord Rudius, what exactly can you do for me? Another way, he was asking what Rudius was willing to do for him. He wanted to know how far his loyalty extended. Well, Rudius thought about it and said, damn it, he's going to do it again, he's going to do it again. Ah, that was a bit too far. Chill out, Rudius. Yeah, that's true. They just proved to me that I'm not really thinking that clearly. All right, let's go talk to the Pope. Hey, what's up, Pope? Can you help me out? Yeah, that does, it is asking you to kind of step out there quite a bit, isn't it? I'll steal a blessed child for you. <laughs> right back to it. Rudius thought about his idea from the previous night. The sudden brainwave he'd shut down as too much. Kidnap the blessed child would be within my power. Kidnapping? What are you saying, Rudius? I'm basically saying that I can hit the demon expulsionist where it hurts the most. It's not what I meant. If you kidnap the blessed child over this, it could mean the end of House Latria. Are you really willing to destroy your own family? What does that mean? That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, if they find out that it was Rudius and that he was connected to House Latria, yeah, I can see them taking down Latria. Or I can see the idea of because he kidnaps the blessed child... The demon expulsionists will go down, their their influence will go down, and House Latria will probably gotten rid of by the Pope. But that's going to happen either way. If he's supporting Cliff right now, no matter what, it's going to eventually lead to Latria being in trouble. If he helps the Pope, or if he helps Cliff, that means the expulsionists will eventually lose. I would assume Cliff's hope is that they win in the end. But it's sort of implying the idea that if he kidnaps the blessed child, they're going to be at fault for it. They're going to be destroyed for it. It seems a bit weird. Rudius turned slowly to Cliff. The Latrias? They aren't my family. Cliff looked away, lost for words. The Pope's smile stayed in place. Of course, I only suggest that because it seemed like it might have value to your holiness. I could reduce the whole town to ashes or clear a forest if that's what it took. That's a good point to be making right after that. that okay, look, I'm just saying this. <laughs> I can do this because... He'd actually like that. And again, I, I did kind of acknowledge that before in the idea of he says, what could you do for me? What would you be willing to do for me? Well, this is a flex to say, I would go this far. That's important to establish. But this part right here creates one of those birds I was talking about earlier that's going to be chirping at some point. Reese only meant to flex, showing what he had up his sleeve. But the Pope stroked his beard again. Did it all sound too good to be true? Reese wondered. He could easily suspect that someone was setting a trap for him. If he wanted to vet out Rudius, it was fine. He had nothing to hide. His only agenda was to get Zenith back. I'm against this. Abduction is a crime. The Latrius may be our enemies. But if you talk to them, Grandfather, I'm sure you can work things out. The Pope didn't reply. And you, Rudius, how can you sink to their level? This isn't like you. Are you sure this isn't just your anger talking? His anger? Absolutely. <laughs> Rudius is like, yeah, <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Again, like I said in the previous Mishuka Mondays, mess with family, Rudius doesn't back down. He always gives until it's family. My point, like I said earlier, is strictly that I think his choice to do this will put his entire family in danger. That's what I was, if, if, if people don't recall, that was what I was talking about with Orsted. With the man god in Orsted, my argument back there that I had a few people pushing back on me for, and again, it was just an aspect of this is what I felt about the situation. I felt the way that things were played out, everything pointed to no matter what you do, Rudius, even if you kill Orsted, the man god is still going to come after your family. The, what was happening there was the man god was literally using Roxy as a hostage to say, I'll stop trying to kill you and your family if you take care of this Orsted person, because eventually one day you're going to join his forces. Your family is going to join Orsted to come kill me. 
So that's the threat. So, hey, yeah, if you get rid of Orsted, kind of gets rid of the threat. But again, I was arguing at that moment, no, Rudius, you're still a threat. And even if you kill Orsted, you're still a threat. And I have the same feeling here in the idea that what you're doing is you're going to resolve the issue, but you're going to create a bigger one. Again, similar to the diary. What was his issue? Roxy was being petrified. He found a resolve. Let's steal that healing spell. And did it solve the issue? Unfortunately, no, because he wasn't in time. But the idea was that it was going to resolve that issue. But in the end, he caused a bigger issue and they came for his family. Is thinking about the repercussions is really what it is. This is a, and he said it earlier, this is a quick fix. This is a knee jerk reaction, but there's no thought put into it. There's no thought put into the repercussions that come from it. Whenever you make decisions, you need to think about the repercussions. Think it all the way through, because if you resolve to the situation as well, there's a hole in front of me, so just jump forward, right? You'll hit the, the ledge. Well, think about it. Can the other ledge take your weight? When you jump over this hole, yeah, you'll probably make it to the other side. That's, a, that's not a very large gap. But you also have to think, what is supporting the ledge on the other side? Is it a strong enough ledge? Will I make it across, but then fall anyways? You have to think it all the way through. But no, I almost, I almost forgot to talk about this. There is a side of me that was like with, Cliff's response is great. It's Cliff really going, no, Rudy, this isn't like you. You're not, you're not thinking right. You're sinking to their level. You're turning into a nasty person. You'll be just like those expulsionists that we are pushing against. Cliff is very passionate about winning this battle with his grandfather. And he has probably seen a lot of horrible things. Now, I will argue, Cliff, you have seen your own father stoop to some nasty things as well. You witnessed your father having people that, I think he implied were like people that were training him at some point, like instructors, were amongst the assassins that were sent by his grandfather to kill this little girl. <laughs> and now he's yelling at Rudius for wanting to abduct that same child. So there is an element here of like, but you're, you're talking in a room where your grandfather wanted, had paid people to kill her. And now you're yelling at Rudius for wanting to kidnap her. <laughs> But there's a side of me that almost like wonders if at some point Cliff had met the blessed child. Now, it didn't seem to imply with his reaction back in the Goblin Slaying chapter that he was afraid for her. Now, I will note that Cliff did disguise himself in that moment, which I kind of hate the anime did it the way it did. The anime didn't have him hide his identity and they changed if they went with them or not. But in the novel, it specifically says that Cliff put a helmet on. He hid his identity from them. And yeah, the assumption at that point is that, yeah, your grandfather literally came, sent people to kill this blessed child. She's of the opposite faction. And then Cliff just walks up without disguising himself. He would put himself in danger because Therese, who's a part of the other faction, could turn and kill him. But then again, he could have been disguising himself because the blessed child knew who he was implying the idea that I wonder if Cliff has ever met her before. And he could be against this because he cares for the blessed child. That would be an interesting twist that at some point we find out that Cliff knows the blessed child and is not okay with her being harmed. Not that he's in love with her, but I don't know. <laughs> he's got Wendy now too. He's getting his harem built up. Reese thought, my anger? Absolutely. Claire's action had him seething with rage. He was furious. It was honestly a miracle that he hadn't gone straight to violence. He wouldn't be nearly as angry if Zenith wasn't involved. He didn't get angry when Edis was injured in a battle with the North Emperor or when Roxy almost died in the battle with the Death God. Why? Because they had chosen it themselves. They come with him of their own free will with the understanding of the risks. If they had died as a result, he would have been devastated. He'd have honored their choices full of regret that he was too weak to protect them. But right now, Zenith didn't have a choice. She neither consented nor refused the invitation in the letter. She was there because Rudius brought her. And now she might end up married off to some stranger, forced to bear his children. If Zenith had been able to choose, if she decided to come herself, that would have been different. If she had refused and fought back against Claire, only to submit, Rudius still would have let it go. Only to the extent that he wouldn't be angry, but still, he'd be consumed by something else. Something different from anger. The kind of despair that made you want to end it all. 
So true. This is really, <laughs> really well put. I really like how this is put. In any other situation, it was fine because they wanted to. Yes, it sucked when Roxy got injured. Yes, it was terrible when Edis was injured. And yes, both situation, Rudius had a, a thought there that they might have died. They could have died. Roxy only survived because she had both of those magic items. Edis only lived because in that one situation, unlike typical that they will do, he wasn't using deadly poison that would have been instantly killing her. I think back then it was specifically saying that it was like a poison that drained their strength. And so in both cases, there was a good chance that they would have died, but they chose to do it. And he would have regretted it insanely, but he would have honored their choices of going along with him. Zenith is way worse than those two situations because she had no choice. Now, you can argue that it did seem like she had some understanding about what was going on, at least with the whole situation with Sylphie and Lilia, and thus she made a decision there. But that could have been very surface level. Again, I argued back in that situation, she thought through a very complicated situation, which in my experience of people with loss of memory or decay of the mind, making a a thought process that involves that many people in a situation like that is a very... It's a massive sign that she is understanding a lot more than what they think she does because it, that takes a lot of effort for somebody in a situation like that to figure out. She had to have known they're about to leave. She had to have known who was leaving. She had to have understand the concept of triage essentially and the importance of one of them staying behind, why one of them would have to stay behind, that there's a pregnancy and that there's a necessity for somebody to be there with the other children as well, there was multiple things going through her head that she processed before coming to that decision that, oh yeah, and they're only not staying here because I'm leaving and I'm leaving for a long time or somewhere far away that would prevent them from being able to just walk back. But even right here, yeah, she was still technically brought there. And that was whose decision? Rudius. Rudius made that decision for her. And because he made that decision for her, she's put in a dangerous place. And that, I understand that feeling. I thoroughly understand the feeling of you making a decision for somebody and then immediately after regretting it, feeling that you made the, the wrong call. Um, one example I have is following a surgery for my father, we put him in a, a, like a temporary nursing place because he literally just had surgery and it was a significant surgery. And so we felt it was best that he goes to a, a nursing place that could help him with rehabilitating. Somebody that will be able to push him through the motions to build up his muscles after a very serious surgery. It was the worst decision I ever made. It's one of those moments where you're like, you assume they're going to be taken care of and that they're going to do a proper job taking care of him. I didn't even care about the money. They literally, because he had no insurance, I had to pay 5000 I had to write a $5,000 check right off the bat. And I didn't even hesitate. And it was only for a week. That's how expensive it was. That wasn't even the problem. The problem was, is that he so badly didn't want to be there because he was confused. He gave a sense that he was being abandoned and he just wasn't being taken care of. They were, they literally just, they gave him a bed to sit in and they would come in and take him out to do some, some training for maybe 10 minutes. The rest of the time he was stuck in a room there's a lady across the hallway screaming, looking for her family. There's a guy in his room that's snoring the entire time. He was, the, the main key thing was that he was alone. He felt his family had left him. He was terrified. He didn't know where he was at. He was scared. Not just me, but we made that decision for him. And I regretted it immediately within 24 hours. The only thing that was keeping me from immediately taking him back out of there is that I felt like medically he needed a trained professional to help him with recuperating from the surgery. When I found out how little effort they were putting into doing that, I told my mother, let's get him discharged. Take him home. I will buy the equipment. We will do it ourselves. And that's what we had to do. Simply, they can't do the job. They're not doing the job. He's terrified. 
let's get him home. Again, I didn't care about the money. It's not that I was well off or anything. I wanted him better. I wanted him taken care of. He wasn't being taken care of, and he was terrified. When I read this segment here, I immediately thought of that. I made the wrong call. He didn't make that call. And now he's alone. And now he's abandoned. And these people are not taking care of him the way that I could take care of him. Anyways, sob story. Moving on. Andrew's sobbing story time. And yes, there is a... There's an element of anger there. <laughs> there is an element of anger there. Anger at yourself. And yeah, anger at the people involved. Not any individual of that, that location specifically. Just more of an aspect that they weren't looking after his well-being. They were just understaffed, really, is what it is. They were just extremely understaffed. Worst money ever spent. A grimy, pathetic sense of self-loathing. That sort of powerlessness. That would have been far harder to bear than anger. But he still would have let it go. This, he couldn't let this go. He couldn't stand back and let Zenith be treated like an object because she couldn't say no. Maybe that was why he wanted to inflict that sense of powerlessness on Claire. Maybe what he wanted was to see her hounded and denounced, having caused the blessed child to be kidnapped. He wanted her desperate and utterly defeated. Rius wanted revenge. Wow, I'm a real bastard, he thought. I guess I can see this. If Again, if this was his mind frame way back there, it, it's, a much, it's much more understanding, I guess, for me. I still don't follow it because it has too much repercussions. It puts too much threat on his family. There's still time, Rudius. Go back and talk to them. I'll even come with you. Cliff, didn't the Latrius do everything they could to help in your search for Zenith? Surely that proves that they care about your mother and your sisters. It's still possible this is a misunderstanding. If you all work together and talk it out, I'm sure that we can get everyone on the same page. Cliff's words tugged a bit at him, but Rudius knew what happened. Talking's great, when talking could fix things. But the old hag wasn't listening. He was pretty far past reconciliation. Their values and attitudes were too different. It felt like trying to reason with someone in a foreign language. How could they talk if they couldn't understand each other? All the same, Rudius would clear his head and think it over. Maybe you're right. Claire and Rudius had different values. That was all. Maybe with the third party there to mediate, they could reach a solution. It couldn't be the Pope, though, not with his position. If he mediated, he'd only end up owing the Latrias. Cliff wasn't ideal either. He was still a nobody in this country. Claire might not be willing to listen to him. There was someone else, though. Finally, brings it up. <laughs> someone that could get through to Claire. One who wouldn't get tangled up in faction rivalries. Honestly, he should have gone to her first, before the Pope. Yep. I'll ask Therese if she can help. My apologies, Your Holiness. Please forget that I mentioned all that about kidnapping. Consider it done. Even amongst the Temple Knights, Therese is a woman of integrity. I'm sure she'll only be too happy to assist you. Rius nodded before Cliff heaved a sigh of relief. <laughs> There's a sign right there. There's a little sign right there. What's to come? This guy, Pope knows this girl. Pope is very familiar with Therese. Now, Therese, again, is part of the, the Temple Knights. It's captain. All that kind of stuff. She has a position. He's going to know who she is. But he seemed to know a bit about her. Woman of integrity. Sure that she'll be happy to assist you. Please forget I mentioned all this about the kidnappings. Consider it done. Go talk to your Therese. I'll talk to her later. <laughs> I'm really thinking what comes up here in a minute is... It's the Pope. I'm sorry. I don't want to think it. I, want, I wanted one Papa Bear. Come on, give me a Papa Bear. Reese decided to work on Therese starting the next day. There was just one small problem. She was a captain of the Blessed Child's Guards. In the ranks of the Temple Knights, she was captain in the Shield Company. She spent every day living alongside the Blessed Child, always protecting her. What did the Blessed Child do? Not a thing. Like the Pope and the others, she was confined in her sanctum of the church headquarters. Apparently, she used to get out and about a fair bit. But the assassination attempt happened. Since then, she hadn't been outside except on church business. In addition to the large number of temple knights and mages specializing in divine and barrier magic stationed at the church headquarters, there was also around 10 guards who were exclusively dedicated to the blessed child's protection. The inner sanctum was one of the most secured locations you can imagine. Therese was always with the blessed child, so getting to see her wasn't going to be easy. Letters wouldn't reach her, and even if he wanted to ask for her directly, she wouldn't come to see him. It almost made him wish that he had gotten the Pope's help. Yeah, was, that was a kind of a thing, like, okay, yeah, I'm not going to do that stuff yet, you know, forget about the whole kidnapping thing, but can you at least send message that I want to talk to her? Still, based on what the Pope said, 
It sounded like the blessed child didn't spend every second shut up in a room. Every few days, she'd briefly be allowed to the inner garden. Her yard time, so to speak. She went out into the garden when it was open to the general congregation. There, she would chat with her guards and spoke to an occasional visitor, living as she did in her own tiny, cloistered world. These short outings were all the blessed child looked forward to. Kind of sounds similar to somebody else. <laughs> it's kind of funny how similar this this entire segment right here like plays out, just like the whole thing with the um, Benedict. Sound like Benedict's story. Those outings were Ruiz's chance to see Therese. He couldn't openly loiter around and wait for her, though. That would cause suspicion. The blessed child was a VIP. It didn't matter if he had business with Therese. If he looked like he was targeting her, he'd end up facing the temple nights. That was why he decided to go to the church gardens pretty much every day. He'd walk to the church like he belonged there, present himself as Cliff's bodyguard. He even made up an excuse that he'd taken interest in the Sark trees. He even took a canvas in to sketch them. The sketch wouldn't take a single day, so it was a good cover story. I don't even know why that wouldn't be immediately seen as suspicious. I mean, yes, he's working, you know, working with Cliff and he's drawing something, but it's like the one garden that she gets to go into every day. Yeah, that seems suspicious, which technically does bring suspicion later, but it was more because somebody heard a bird chirp. <laughs> in the meantime, Geese and Aisha were moving everything else along. Aisha sped around the city like a bolt train, looking for a building for the mercenary band. Meanwhile, Geese uses contacts to keep him watch on Latria's servants. The three of them carried on until the blessed child's day off came around. Oh, Sir Radius. She cried out as soon as she seen him and ran over. You're back again today. Now you must tell me about Lady Edis, just as you promised. Ruiz obliged, recounting what was new with Edis. There were a lot of good stories, and the blessed child listened enthusiastically. Her guards kept a wary eye on him. Their job was to keep an eye out for suspicious people. Ruiz wasn't suspicious at all. Everyone knew that he was a friend of Cliff's and related to Therese. Yeah, you're just like, I'm good. Not suspicious at all. <laughs> After talking with the blessed child, Rhys raised his concern with Therese. Ah, that. Apparently she had heard about Zenith's abduction too. She took the matter seriously right away. I can hardly believe Mother would do something so barbaric. Look, I have the day off soon. I'll go talk with Mother as well. Don't worry. Zenith won't be married off to some strange man in the meantime. I'm sure of it. She put her hand to her breasts. They weren't as big as Zenith's. And made a... <laughs> Look, it's got throw this in here. And made this vow. Rhys felt like he can trust her. The only thing is... Mother was dead set against me becoming a knight, so she may not listen to me. So what do you do if she doesn't? There are strings I can pull if it comes to that. I'll talk to father or my brother. Just leave it to me. He really felt like he could trust her. Flag. Flag, 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 flag. <laughs> flag, flag. It is interesting because she is saying I can hardly believe that mother would do something that barbaric. But she's going to go talk to her. And she has found out about this. She knows about this. So it is like one of those things of like, how did that word get to her? How did she find out? By the way, I'm not sure if I mentioned it yet, but yeah, I'm going to get into it in a minute. I do have my suspicions around Therese. And I think it's because subconsciously, I, I kind of tap this thing back here and I kind of confirmed that I thought about it when I was doing Mashuka Monday or watching the Mashuka Monday from last Mashuka Monday. It is technically odd that Teresa immediately knows who Rudius is. <laughs> there is an oddity about Ru that her she immediately recognized Rudius. Now you can say Rudius is very unique looking. He's got that, you know, that, that his hair and whatnot, very handsome, whatever. But it has been 12 years, technically. She's, I think they say about 10 years, but I think that was like 12 years. It's been 12 years. He's twice the age that he was then. He was barely a teenager. And now he is an adult. Almost fully grown adult. And she immediately recognized him. Yeah, it's a bit of a stretch there. That is a bit of a stretch. Now, I do agree that in a lot of cases for a lot of people, it is much easier to recognize your relatives after a long period of time than it is to recognize just a random friend that you haven't seen for like 10 years. But that that it, there is there is a suspicion there. There, I admit there is a suspicion there. And right here, it doesn't help that he's flagging it by saying, "I can really trust her." And I felt like I can really trust her. <laughs> I feel like I can really trust her. And it sucks that she has Zenith face while she's saying all that stuff because there is an aspect of like having a little bit more trust than normal with somebody just because it looks like my mom. Days passed, still no sight of Zenith. Geese told Rudius that none of the servants were acting suspiciously. No secret meetings outside their Latria estate nor any outsiders coming in or out of the house. Obviously, there was no sign of anyone that looked like Zenith either. He's figured that meant that Zenith was probably inside the house. Aisha had set up a new mercenary band office. The building was a former tavern in the corner of the merchant district. Now she was in the process of stocking up preserved food and clothing. Rui set up a contact stone and emergency teleportation circle. 
The circle hooked up to the scroll that he kept with himself and ran off magic crystals. He could only use it once, and he hoped that he wouldn't need it. Right off the bat, he used the contact tablet to call Orsted and ask for advice. After writing on an explanation, he got a reply. Orsted gave him new information, along with his predictions of the man god's next move. First, he told him about the blessed child. The blessed child had no other name. She forfeited it when she was taken in by the church. That was my assumption there. The moment they discovered her power, they, they brought her in. That's what she's called. In a situation like this, there's multiple reasons. One is to bolster her importance by giving her this, this title rather than having her just have a name. Additionally, yes, it might have her connections to a commoner family, which will lessen the importance of her. And additionally, it brings to light individuals that, that people can use as hostages against her. The sad thing that creates, it seemingly can create an aspect of her feeling like she is not a person, but rather an object. Big shock, I know. From that day on, although everyone bowed to her in public, in reality, she had become a tool. The blessed child possessed an ability called memory skimming. When she looked into a person's eyes, she could see their memories. <laughs> it's like immediately upon reading that. Yeah, of course, I'm thinking, damn, get this girl in front of Zenith. Please, please get this girl in front of Zenith. She literally, what I'm feeling like is that she can literally look into Zenith's eyes and possibly see what she is seeing in there. There's nothing that I would have loved more than when the later moments of what I've dealt with with memory loss and that segment is to really know what all they can still see, how much of them still is in there, how much are they thinking, and how much of it is that they can't speak anymore, how much of it is that they're in there, they're 100% in there, it's just they can't speak, they've lost the ability to speak, how much does she remember, is she getting her memories back, again, there was a feeling that she lost everything, but then there's these little signs like picking up the gauntlets, Picking up the armor that was Paul's. That kind of stuff. Again, remembering Geese. Which could have been because after she got out of the crystal, she traveled with Geese for a while, but still. And yeah, technically, I, I, I thought immediately here too is like, disguise yourself, kidnap the blessed child, and take her in front of Claire. Kidnap her in disguise. Kidnap Claire in disguise. Put them in a room together. Tell the blessed child to look into her eyes. Tell me where Zenith's at. <laughs> Have her confess everything. Because they do imply here, yes, that's her job. That's literally what the blessed child's job is. Is to basically be the judge, the jury, everything. It's the punisher. Her job was to carry out inquisitions. She was summoned for both internal church investigations and public court cases. To read the suspect's memories. A word from the blessed child was enough to condemn you. Wonder why people want to get rid of her so badly. <laughs> Even if you were the noble or a bishop who pulled off the perfect crime, the ultimate lie detector, the king of Millis himself attested to her powers. Surprising. That was like the first time we've actually mentioned a king system here. Because I was, that was a side of me that was curious about that. If the, if Millis was ruled by the church or if it was a secondary power or if it's a, it's a 50-50 power. It sort of implies here this king is important and because... This one faction of the church controls a blessed child. They're gaining favor. The king seems to be pretty peachy about this blessed child. She was the entire reason the cardinal faction was on the ascent, while the pope's faction declined. But she could only see memories. A part of Verdius wondered if the blessed child could get Zenith's memories back. Orsid said it was probably impossible, given the blessed child's power only extended to seeing. But that's my thing. That's enough for me. Just to know. That's big. And additionally, technically, it could give signs of recovery. Like, if you can have her be checked by the blessed child on a regular basis, it's like almost like getting an actual scan of the brain on a regular basis to see if it's improving or, or going down. Even so, if the opportunity arose, he was going to give her a try. Unfortunately, non-believers couldn't just pop up and borrow the blessed child whenever they felt like it. <laughs> it's like people coming up and just, they got a line. Can we use you? The church, which... In reality, meant the cardinal kept a tight control on the use of her powers. Yeah, you only want it used against your enemies, right? You had to get his permission. Not just outsiders, everyone, even the royal family or the pope. The blessed child was off limits. That's interesting right there. I was mentioning that earlier in the idea of the mention of the king. That's saying even the royal family has to get permission. Almost implies a 50-50. Almost implies a 50-50. The blessed child was off limits. Reese might have gotten her to like him a little bit. But that didn't mean that he could just ask her to swing by the Latria abode 
and expose the lies. The other thing about the almighty blessed child was that her destiny was extremely fragile. That would explain if the man God has never seen her. Because again, that it only the, he it seemingly only meets with them when they have strong destinies. Because you're going to be asking them to do something, you want a strong destiny to be able to one survive, but be able to push against another destiny. If you talk to somebody that has a weak destiny, and you tell that weak destiny, "Hey, go club this person over here," and they have a strong destiny, it's more likely that that strong destiny will overcome it. So it does technically clear her a bit. And yes, that also explains that. Yeah, she probably dies a lot. <laughs> Unfortunately, croaked a lot. There weren't any time loops where she made it to 30. Poor girl. <laughs> and more often than not, she died at around the age of 10. Or had said that, given her destiny and her powers, the chances that she was a disciple of the man god were practically non-existent. So the, yeah, the question is, does she know about destinies? Or... Has she met Orsted before? Oh my gosh, that is a curious question right there. <laughs> that is a f can of worms right there if I've ever seen one. What are the chances? I would actually expect Orsted to have mentioned this, honestly. What are the chances that Orsted had traveled at some point and met the Blessed Child and she looked into his eyes and seen all of his memories and that would be how she would know about the man god and be able to definitively state i have never met him and i probably never will she seemed to have known that she would never meet this man god and that would explain how because i looked into this one man's eyes and he showed me so many timelines where i died over over and over again and never once did i see this person he was talking about in these memories nor did he ever meet a me that had talked about the man god that is, yeah that that technically opens that can of worms i wonder if she has a full-on knowledge of everything that's happening in that world because of that now it doesn't explain how much she gets from those memories that she just looks at it or does it download it all into her head as she has can she recall things in those memories that's a massive question mark, but it does imply if it is like a download of that information, all those memories just come into her head that she would have like a massive amount of knowledge of everything that even what Ruiz is currently doing, she would have that knowledge. Man, that's a massive can of worms. But yeah, going back there. Yeah, it does kind of make me wonder if it's not that if it's just that she knows about destiny, if she has a knowledge about destiny and the importance of it and the effects that it would have for the man god. Next up was House Latria. There was currently four Latrias who were of age, not including Zenith. The head of the house, Count Carlisle Latria, his wife, Countess Claire Latria, their eldest son, Temple Knight Edgar Latria, the fourth eldest daughter, Temple Knight Therese Latria, their eldest daughter, Anise Latria, had married the Marcus of Burkrant, whose estate was in a town around a day's journey to the west of Milshan, so she wasn't in the city. The same was true for the eldest son, Edgar. He was a junior captain in the Temple Knights, and he was stationed in the same town as Anise. Their father, Carlisle, was a Temple Knight senior commander. His role kept him extremely busy, and while on duty, he almost always stayed at the barracks. He came home perhaps one day in every ten. As Ruiz concluded in his prior investigations, Therese, as captain of the Blessed Child's Guard, stayed at the church. She essentially lived there, even when she wasn't on duty. This meant that, practically speaking, Claire was the absolute mistress of the manor. According to Orsted, Claire Latria was the eldest daughter of the Latria family. Fiercely stubborn from the day that she was born, she was raised to be hard on herself and those around her. She never, ever backed down once she made a decision. And apparently, would to the day that she died, Carlisle had married into her family. They had one son and four daughters. To the best of Orsa's knowledge, she was an unremarkable noblewoman who would never do anything particularly noteworthy and would pass on from this world and leave it tidily, as if she'd never been here. She valued fairness and detested crime. Orsted said that she wasn't a type to go around kidnapping people. Again, all this stuff really pushes towards there being something else is telling her to do it. Orsted then gave a detailed rundown on the internal power struggles with the Mills Church. As Roost already knew, the church was divided between the Pope and the Cardinal faction. 
The schism between the two occurred about 300 years ago. Until the schism, the Millish church followed the word of scripture, where it was written that all demons shall be destroyed and expelled all demon folk. This was the church's stance until one priest's attention fell on the line. All races are equal under Millis and argued that should demons not be also equal. Thus triggered the schism. The struggle for power between the demon expulsionist faction and the demon integrationist faction had gone on ever since. This is how things stood now. Yeah, I basically created a denomination. <laughs> the denominations are after each other. <laughs> this is how things stood now. The Pope's faction supported demon integration. Currently, this faction was the largest. The majority of the common folks and the missionary knights belonged to this faction. They were known as the Pope's faction, integration faction, etc. The cardinal faction supported demon expulsion. They controlled the blessed child, the temple knights, and most of the older noble families. The Latrias were one such family. It was commonly known as the cardinal faction, blessed child faction, demon expulsionist, etc. The royal family and the cardinal knights were neutral. Around 40 to 50 years ago, back when the expulsionists were winning, other races in Milshin faced severe prejudice, and there had been a lot of fighting with the Great Forest. In the end, the integrationists had put an end to the relatively severe bout of fighting with the demon folk. Their influence had grown, and the cardinal who favored integration had snatched the Pope's throne. After that, the integration faction had the power to act however it pleased. But then the blessed child had been born, and the expulsionists had rallied around her. An expulsionist archbishop was elevated to cardinal, and the balance began to tip back to the expulsionist favor. That was how they arrived to now. That's a pretty decent little introduction to that whole story. It kind of makes sense. I wonder if there was something in there that was implied earlier. Like the whole aspect that 40, 50 years ago, um, there was this kind of conflict that was happening. And there was something that kind of happened with this whole fight with the Great Forest. I wonder if that has something to do with, um, not Bakshil, the guy that Rajur knew. I wonder if he was involved with that. Finally, the man-god's interference. Ors had said that no one of particular importance currently was in Millis. With Millis being a country it was, when Laplace began his war, it would never side with the demon folks, regardless of who was in charge. That meant that all the political machinations were a wash to both Orsted and the Mangod. Of course, Rius's ideal outcome would have Cliff on the Pope's throne. It was possible the Mangod was orchestrating something to prevent that from happening. But the question mark is, why would that matter? My opinion here is that, yes, this makes perfect sense that Orsted is saying this. Yeah, this, this place is why I'm not really bugged about it. I mean, it's whatever. Whatever happens there doesn't matter because in the end, they're going to help me. So I don't need to get involved there. There's nothing the man god can do to change Millis to not want to kill Laplace. To not stop Laplace's demon army. I mean, hold my beer moment, I guess. Yeah, I t I technically something could happen. It technically, getting with the integrationists would be more likely that you could avoid some sort of conflict. Which, yes, could lead the idea that the man-god could possibly want the expulsionist gone. Maybe the man-god wants the expulsionist gone. That way, there's less likely that they would want to stop the demon folk. But then, no way, I would think they would want to stop them. Whether Cliff is on the throne or not, if he doesn't care about Millis, he's not going to care about Cliff being in lead. Unless Cliff being there will cause them to take action quicker. If the man-god's involved here, it's to kill Rudius. If the man-god is involved here, it would probably be to bring down Millis upon him. The man-god, technically in this timeline, if he knows what was in that book that Rudius read, which it seemed to imply that he knew everything that Rudius read in that book, that, that diary, then he knows that Millis came down on Rudius pretty damn strong and that he could possibly want that to happen again to cause Rudius to be an enemy of Millis. But if that were the case, he had a weird way of going about it. Kidnapping Zenith was totally unrelated. No, Rudeus didn't have to worry about the man-god here. When in doubt, kill. Your enemy's intentions will die with them. That was Orsid's final words. <laughs> I love that Orsid is so simple. Just kill him. <laughs> what are you waiting for? Just go kill them all. Rudeus felt like he might actually do that. Still, with all that info Orsid relayed, Rudeus felt he probably should have gotten all that beforehand. That said, the decision to come to Millis had been a sudden one. The plan was just to call in, say hello, and leave. But he'd been a bit overly optimistic. When the time came to go to the King Dragon Realm, he'd be more prepared. A few days passed, then Therese came back with good news. She didn't say it outright, but Mother more or less admitted that she got Zenith. No way. Therese had one of her rare days off to go see Claire on his behalf. She needled her mother with questions until she managed to get an indirect admission that Claire ordered a servant to deceive Geese and abduct Zenith and that she now was holding Zenith captive somewhere. There's something off about her, though. Like she's hiding something or feeling conflicted. 
I'm sure she doesn't seriously intend to marry my sister off, but even so, hmm. What about Zenith's location? I'm sorry, I couldn't pry that out of her. Therese's face clouded over. Her attempts to get the location had failed. She then tried to persuade her mother to return Zenith. She told her, I don't know what you've done to Zenith, but surely you're taking on too much. Try to find a partner for a widow who's lost her mind. You probably haven't realized how amazing Rius is, but this is a guy who can just pop up and see the Pope. You really ought to treat him with more respect. If he says he'll look after her for as long as he's alive, why not just let him? Still, Claire remained equivocal and refused to give a clear answer. In the end, she started asking when I'm going to get married. Therese sighed. I'm sorry. Whenever that subject comes up, we always end up in a fight. Gies had told Rius that as far as he could tell, nothing had been set in motion since the abduction. Therese said that it seemed like Claire was hiding something, or maybe that she was conflicted. Orsett himself said kidnapping was way out of character. Something was definitely up with Claire. Even if there was, so what about her motives? It wasn't like she ever spared a thought for Rudius and his feelings. She acted like he might as well not exist. A good point here that technically, yeah, again, obviously, a lot of this right here is really hitting heavy on the idea this Claire's not acting right. Again, her own daughter's like, this isn't like her. Orsted is saying, she's never done this. Again, pushing really heavily that somebody out externally, man god, or somebody else, somebody else being told by the man god is pushing. And yes, it had to be somebody important. If it's not the man god directly telling Claire, get your daughter back, send a letter to Rudius, get him back. And that could have been why it took so long for her to send a letter. Finally, one day, Man God talks to her. Yeah, you remember you got that letter about your daughter? The one that you ignored because you're like, whatever, she's lost her mind. I don't need her. Bring her home. Reeves was saying that it took her a long time to send a letter back, which he excused by, it probably took a long time for the letter to get there. It could have been that she was sitting on it for a long time, and then the moment the Man God chirped at her, okay, bring it back in. Or somebody very important was told to marry Zenith. And they contacted her and they got them to bring in Zenith immediately. And the question mark there was, crap, is she still functioning because they're going to want to make a child? It's definitely painting that something's going on with Claire. And yeah, if her goal here is to marry off Zenith, which it does seem like she's very driven on that, she doesn't want Rudeus to exist. Because he's a son of somebody that she's planning on marrying off to somebody important. And that would be bad that she already has a child. But hey, the House of Latria can't even find me a husband. There's no way Claire will find somebody to marry Zenith just like that. Flag. <laughs> what? Oh yeah, you're right. Definitely. Mother's just being stubborn. We'll attack her from all sides next time. I've talked to father and asked my brother and sister to come. You wouldn't think so. But mother always takes my father's word to heart. That's actually a very interesting note. Again, she is of the House Latria. He was married into the House of Latria. And she was born, raised to do this role. And yet it seems like she would take his word. That shows that she's in love with him. Or at least respects him as the man of the house. If he and my brother talk to her, I know she'll at least listen. You've thought of everything. Thank you. Don't thank me. My mother started all this. I want to hope that Therese is good. <laughs> This chapter's got a doubt at me, but I hope she's good. I hope this is all not just her lying. Yeah, I'm getting father and the brothers involved because like they imply that these people are busy. The brothers are in different towns. The sisters in different towns. The father's always busy. He's at the barracks. He's got a big job. Is he literally going to drop everything to come talk to his wife about a broken daughter? I uh -huh. kind of wonder. Therese had done a fantastic job, so much so that Rius had to wonder what on earth had motivated this level of devotion. We'll find out in a minute. He'd only ever met her once, maybe twice before. If you do want to thank me, though, you can introduce me to a few Osferin knights. <laughs> maybe maybe some nobles from there. Therese, are you finished? As they were wrapping up, the blessed child came over. Therese's demeanor changed in an instant. But, but blessed child, forgive me. I should not be discussing my personal business while on duty. Think nothing of it. This is for Lady Edis's husband, after all. I owe her a big debt of gratitude. And St. Millis is always watching. <laughs> she's she's pushing her to get the job done. Now it made sense. Therese wasn't helping Rudius for his sake alone, but for Edis too. This might actually be the first time anyone had thanked Rudius for something Edis had done. <laughs> That's so mean. That's so mean. Right, once the kids were older, he'd bring Edis here. Bless child, it's almost time. 
Let us escort you back to your room. Master Rudius, keep up the good work. The otaku knight's attitude towards Rudius had softened lately too. When he first showed up, his connection to the Pope's faction had gotten them guarded, but they didn't get up into his face much these days. They were always wary, but they seemed to have decided that he was a neutral party. Well, after all the effort he put in, they better think that. He'd gone out of his way to be a total beta mill, refusing to speak in an off-puttingly formal fashion due to her status, and always making her smile with amusing stories. Spending time with him always put the blessed child in a good mood. And Rudeus heard that she looked forward to her visits, even after she returned to her rooms. He'd worked hard to make that happen. When the captain herself let her guard down around him, suspicion began to feel stupid and overcautious. Honestly, she should probably be more suspicious. He could have snatched the blessed child up any time when he felt like it. Not that he would. Although if Teresa's efforts went nowhere, and he was backed into a corner, he would do it. When push came to shove, he'd always put Zenith first. If he didn't, he couldn't face his dead father, or Lilia. That was why he made sure to never meet the blessed child's eyes. Yeah, think about that right now while the blessed child's right there. <laughs> but again, Orsa did say specifically it had to be the eyes. Had to look in the eyes. But yeah, there could always be a slip up. But, but I have, I have, a, I have the feeling that she wouldn't do anything. I have a feeling she's probably seen it. I think she knows. And if she doesn't know, if she did see, I don't think she would care. There's a side of me that thinks that she does not have that much value in her own life. I think she, if, if she looked at Rudeus' eyes and she's seen, oh, he's thinking about kidnapping me in order to save his mom. Okay. If that'll help him, sure. I think the, I think the blessed child would totally do it. If it will help the husband of Edis who saved my life, sure. Why not? Hey, you, you, let's go. Like, I think she would encourage him to do it. <laughs> he knew that she could see memories. But not how deep the sight went. Who knows? It might not even extend deep enough to see that he was seriously considering grabbing her. Then again, it might. The guaranteed safe option was to make sure that he never made eye contact. Rius was sure none of the guards had noticed this. Even if they had, apparently everyone tried to avoid her eyes within the church. It seemed no one liked the idea of someone peeking into their memories. Abducting her would be easy. And you know what? At this point, it seems like they're so pushing this idea... Now, granted, at the end of this chapter, it does imply, obviously, that this kind of leads to something, but it's like, god dang, there's so much talk in these first two chapters about abducting her. It's like, almost you feel like, he, now you have to. Like, <laughs> like you wrote this so much into this brain, it's like he now has to at some point. Otherwise, we wasted two chapters talking about how we're going to do it, and we never do it. But now it's going to lead to somebody finding out that he was planning on it. Of course, that could still lead into him doing it just because, I mean, if I'm going to be seen as I'm doing it, I might as well do it. All he got to do was place a teleportation circle under the chair that she always sat down at. When the time came, he distracted the guards and activated it. After she disappeared, he'd be a suspect, but there'd be no evidence. The ink on the magic circle would vanish, leaving only paper. It wouldn't even occur to most to suspect teleportation. Once she teleported to the mercenary office, Aisha would stand guard over her while Rudius opened negotiations. He didn't want to use that plan if he could help it, though. He'd feel bad for doing that to Therese. She was on his side. She was angry that Claire had been so brutal. And she conned so far to contacting siblings to come back to the Milshin from so far away. He didn't know how Carlisle, who had to be nearby, felt about all this. But Therese herself was making a genuine effort to make Claire change her mind. If the blessed child were kidnapped, that would be her failure. Yeah, she's already failed technically once with the whole blessed child thing. Again, it was just her men. But still, she'd be done for. Therese, if it's not so much of a strain of your time, I'd be very grateful if you could introduce me to Lord Carlisle and my uncle and aunt as well. I really ought to meet them, and I want to personally request their assistance. Oh, of course. But if that's what it took, if he had to, he'd be ready. If disgracing himself would allow him to keep his promise to Paul and Lilia, he'd do it. But he'd give Therese her shot. If it looked like her efforts weren't going anywhere, maybe he'd give it a shot in grabbing the blessed child after facing the guards in a fair fight. No sneaky tricks. A total opposite of the plan that he'd prepped. I guess give them a chance to defend her... <laughs> I wish Mother would put these efforts into finding me someone instead. When Zenith already has a great guy to take care of her, Therese sighed before grumbling to herself as she left. <laughs> Gonna bring Therese in the hair. Just bring Therese in the family. She can stay at the house. Take care of her. Therese bowed his head once more. She didn't want a guy like him. <laughs> he's in there thinking about something diabolical, and she's like, oh, he's such a great man. Yeah, I'm not that great. After a few days passed, it was morning. Maybe the 15th day since they arrived in this country. After Isa finished setting up the mercenary office and started helping geese, the two of them brought new information. Yesterday, a tailor shop worker visited the Latria estate. Aisha paid someone to bring her the tailor. 
the person revealed that they've been called to take a woman's measurements for a bridal gown. The woman was getting a bit in the ears for a bride, and her eyes were empty. It was Zenith, beyond a doubt. More news. Claire's butler had met a few times with someone from the church in secret. The only natural conclusion was that Claire was picking out a husband for Zenith. And if that was the case, they were running out of time. It wasn't time to panic yet. After receiving Teresa's message, the Latrius's eldest son and daughter were on their way. They had sent Teresa a letter which said, To marry off a daughter who cannot speak for herself is surely impermissible. It was nice to know that his aunt and uncle were decent folks. Rue still hadn't met Lord Carlyle. He was probably busy with his duties as a military commander. Therese reassured Rudius, saying, Father would never condone what Claire has done. Aisha had fond memories of the head of the House of Latria as well. She said that he always was kind to her. What he had to say about the business of Zenith was a different story, but Rudius wanted to talk to him soon. Yeah, there's a side that makes me really want to meet this Carlisle person and be like, thank you for actually being the only person that seemed like they were nice to Aisha. <laughs> it's a good dude, even though he allowed all that stuff to happen. But now there's a lot of right here that's kind of building up that I'm, I'm kind of suspicious of. I just don't see these people going out of their way for her. I don't see any of them going out of their way for them. So there is a bit of a suspicion that's kind of building on Therese right here. Is she really talking to all these people? Are these letters authentic that Therese is seeing apparently? Because it's like, if I do want to suspect Therese as possibly being uh, against Therese right here, like what if she's doing what Claire tells her to do? What if she's just throwing him a bone? I think that she would probably downplay the whole situation if she was working with Claire. She'd probably say, no, Claire doesn't have Zenith. I, for sure, he doesn't have Zenith. She'd downplay it. So she's at least not working for Claire. But is she feeding Rius a bunch of stuff to, to stay his hand for a little bit? I don't see that either. As much as it feels weird that all these family members are so dead set on stopping Claire over Zenith, who they probably at this point might not care about. Again, she left the family a long time ago, ran off. Why would they care about the well-being of Zenith? I mean, Zenith could have ran away strictly because the mother and her upbringing, how strict they were, but the family in general could love Zenith. I don't know. It just feels weird that everybody's dropping what they're doing and rushing home to stop Claire from marrying off Zenith. Why would they care? Claire couldn't keep this up. If her husband and the whole family were against her, she might be in charge of the estate, but she wasn't the head of the house. It didn't matter what she had planned. Rudius had her in check. He couldn't thank Therese enough for how she had flown into action to help. Even if things went wrong, he knew where Zenith was, and he had an idea of how well-equipped Claire was to fight him. If he contacted Therese beforehand, he was pretty sure that he can get the building's layout and guard positions. If Carlisle took Rudius aside, though, there would be no need for violence. He strong-armed his way to Zenith, give Claire a piece of his mind, and that'd be the end of it. It was a relief that things were resolving well. No problems for Cliff. And he'd build up his relationship with the other Latrias. Yeah, it's kind of a nice thing about this whole situation. Again, if this is all playing out the way that it seems like it's implying. That, yeah, he's he's finding out the rest of this family's fine. He hated Claire's guts. I hated Claire's guts. But again, I think through Therese, you're kind of seeing that the rest of them are kind of cool. Like, it, it, you don't have to burn down the entire house because of this lady's being an idiot. But yeah, to my previous statements that I made earlier was, yeah, it does seem like Claire is, she's trying to rush things. She is really pushing to get things done. Pulling in a tailor and everything. Again, it has only been 15 days. They arrived in Millis 15 days ago. That means Zenith has only been in their possession for two weeks. And she's already getting a bridal gown made. She's rushing. She's in a hurry. Again, probably due to somebody pushing her, get her married. Marry her off to this person. She needs to marry this person. And there's a side of me that's kind of curious if, if there's a chance the man God's not involved. Even if, again, whoever is trying to marry Zenith might be a very powerful person, and that's why Claire is trying to rush to get her to that person and get them married. Because it's, I don't know, say a person in royalty. Let's say somebody in Millis royalty is contacted by the man god or something and wants to marry Zenith specifically. Yeah, I can see Claire getting stuff done fast. But let's take the man god out of the picture completely. What other reason would Zenith be important? 
There's a side of me that almost wonders if they see a value in somebody that has been trapped inside of a crystal. That they know what we know about what happened with Ellen Elise. Like they know that there is a side effect to being trapped inside of a crystal and that it causes a blast slash curse. And so they can possibly see that Zenith will be another possible blessed child. Similar to this blessed child. That they see that there's a possibility that one day they can use Zenith to be similar to the blessed child. Another powerful blessed child that they can utilize. That's why they want Zenith so bad. That's why they won't let Rudeus take her. Because she could be a potential powerful ally alongside their other blessed child. It's just more curious that why wouldn't Therese know that? I would see Claire telling Therese that. An easy way for her to give an excuse to Therese that Therese might understand. You don't realize she's a possible blessed child. We have to keep her around. There have been a few unexpected twists along the way, but everything looked like it was going to work out. It was a good thing that he didn't do anything stupid. Reaching out to people around him and using them to build bridges was the right call. There had never been a need to kidnap the blessed child. He hadn't been thinking straight. I like how he just finally decides, I'm glad I didn't do that. And then he gets called for it. He only had the crazy idea because it was a quick solution. Yep, exactly. But in the end, slow and steady wins the race. Maybe he wouldn't be able to get even, but he can let that go if he got mother back. Arriving at the garden once again at the church headquarters, over the past two weeks or so, the Sarak trees had lost their flowers. But in his painting, they were still full in bloom. His painting's trees sent an eternal spray of pink petals fluttering through the air. It was almost finished. And it was horrible. <laughs> it's bad. The Blessed Child's fan brigade had a great time mocking him about it. The moment he added the Blessed Child in her white dress, though, they changed their tune. Suddenly, it was a heartbreaking work of staggering genius. These guys weren't hard to read. <laughs> The blessed child even asked him to give her the painting when he was finished. He told her while he was no artist, it was hers if she wanted it. He was going to secretly make a figurine for her to go along with it. It occurred to him that he didn't need to stamp out the influence of the demon expulsionists if he could just get the blessed child to declare from on high that the sale of figurines was permitted. He wouldn't start selling demon figurines right away. They'd introduce new models one by one until adding demon ones to the series later. Uh, well, never mind. The blessed child probably didn't have that authority. <laughs> just keep sneaking them in. Just, just make little alterations, and suddenly, suddenly they're like, why does this character have a little dot on their head right there? And then, like, two series later, now it's kind of like a spike. Slowly grows horns. Wait, as Reeves reached the garden, something felt off. There was someone there. They're here already? Every time, up until now, a few guards came to patrol the area after he arrived. After that, the blessed child came out. At this time of the day, he should be the only one here. Maybe the patrol had already started. Or maybe it was someone else. Stepping in the garden, no one was there. The aura he felt was probably just his imagination. It wasn't like he had reserves, laser point eyes. Huh? Rudeus noticed one item he didn't recognize. On top of his easel, there was a lit candle. Just one. The flame shivered in the sunlight. When he approached, he saw footprints on the ground. One set. They led away under the Sarak trees. Was someone hiding back there? Behind the trunks? Therese? He called out hesitantly. Rudeus opened his eye of foresight. Who's there? He activated his magic armor, readying for battle. Approaching the Sarak trees, staying on alert, he kept his distance and waited for them to come out before hitting them in their blind spot. The blessed child liked that tree, so he'd be careful not to damage it. When magic would do the trick, whoever strikes first wins. What the? The magic in his hand dispersed. By the time he managed to think, it was too late. He tried to step back, but came in contact with a wall. He turned, but there was nothing there. Looking down, shining faintly blue in the morning light, was a magic circle. Barrier magic. Rudeus seen this barrier magic before. If he tried to step out of the circle, he'd be blocked by an invisible wall, and any magic he tried to use while in the circle was dispelled. He'd seen this before. It's a king tier barrier, Rudeus. A figure slowly walked from behind the tree. A woman, clad in blue plate armor, if not hidden under a blocky helmet, would have looked just like Zenith's. She had not come alone. Men in armor emerged one by one from behind the trees, another from out behind the bushes. It was the Ataku, always hanging around her princess, otherwise known as the Temple Knights, or so he assumed. It was hard to tell with their weird helmets. I'm sorry, but I got a tip off that you were planning on kidnapping the blessed child. Reese didn't know what to say. The knights spread out to stand in a circle around the barrier. Therese was the only one out in the open, facing him directly. You are accused of heresy. Your inquisition begins now. As one, the helmeted knights drew their swords and beat them into the ground. An odd, grating clang rang through the garden. 
f***ing Pope. It's the f***ing Pope, dude. It's the Pope. I'm sorry. It's gotta be the Pope. Okay. Who knows what Rudius wanted to do? Yes. The blessed child could have read his memories. At some point, he may have slipped up. Maybe he, maybe all she has to do is she just has to see his eyes and she can read it. Not that she has to look directly into them and like they have to be like we're this far away from each other. She can just literally glance at his eye, the side of his eyeball and bam, she can read it. She could know. But again, I argue if she knew, she wouldn't care. Again, if she wants to help Edis, the husband of Edis, she'd be perfectly fine with being a captive in order to help Zenith and help him and Proxy. I don't think she cares. I think she even trusts him enough that he wouldn't try to harm her and be perfectly fine with it. Cliff, I don't see that. I don't see him contacting a member of the Temple Knights to tell them that your blessed child, the key to helping my rival faction is in danger and getting Rudius possibly killed here. He's not going to do that. Ain't no way in hell. Aisha. <laughs> no. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Aisha's like, I'll get you now, big brother. <laughs> and Aisha was behind it all. <laughs> it's been revealed. Aisha has been behind it all. She finally got him. After so many years, she's finally got Rudius right where she wants him. He's dead, man. Now Aisha's going to be able to return home victorious and claim her house of harem because Rius never accepted her. She's just going to take all the girls. She, she, she's going to take the house of girls. Now, anyways, the last one's a pope. Pope's, oh, geese. Geese? Geese is a big possibility. Again, if geese's whole thing here is he's trying to cause Rudius to get in conflict with the cardinalists, and over the last few days, we've been seeing signs that this might resolve peacefully. That Geese is involved with them discussing this whole thing. And Reese is like, this is great. Therese says that she's got a chance. She's going she's gonna to bring the family in. They're going to stop her. Everything's going to be fine. Aisha, we're going to get mom back. We're not going to have to do anything crazy. It's all working out. And Geese is sitting off the side going, that ain't good. I need them fighting. All right. Do you want to do this? But I'll have to go tell Therese that. Rudeus is going to try to kidnap him. Would the Temple Knights listen to a demon? I don't think so. Last one. I, again, Geese is a, a strong possibility. But he would have to leave a letter or tell somebody to tell them because they ain't going to listen to him. He's like a 30%. The 70% is the last person, which is, yes, the Pope. The Pope wants Rudeus to help him fight against the Cardinalist. And the best way that he can get Rudeus and by proxy... Orsted involved in this conflict so that he can secure victory against the Cardinalists. Because again, the Pope ain't doing well. And I doubt Cliff showing up is going to help him. Like Cliff showed up and he's like, good to have you back, kid. He was even said in the letter, you know, it's going bad, but I would welcome you back. But he knows Cliff ain't going to fix things. I mean, there is a chance that he sent the letter to Cliff knowing that he was best friends with Rudius and that possibly that would give them a a big jolt of extra energy by having Cliff back. He brings in Rudius. But yeah, he knows that Rudius is planning on kidnapping the blessed child. Again, said, please forget this. You know, forget I ever said that. The Pope's like, no, that's a good thing. Thanks for telling me that. Oh, crap. Things are resolving with them. Yeah. Hey, Therese, over here. Heard that Rudius wants to kidnap blessed child. Can't have that happen. Go ahead. It's the Pope. <laughs> it's totally the Pope. He doesn't want this to resolve peaceful. He wants Rudius to get in their faces. He wants that conflict. That sucks. It really does. So yeah, the question mark is, what's their idea of an Inquisition? I mean, they have the blessed child in their possession. Or, I mean, she's... They they guard the blessed child. So the assumption here is that they probably have built this barrier to lock him in. They surround him. And my assumption is going into the next chapter, blessed child comes out. They call the blessed child out. She goes up there, looks him in the eyes to see if he was, in fact, planning on kidnapping her. And to my point that I said earlier, I think what she's going to see is that, yes, he, in his memory, somewhere in there, at some point, was going to kidnap her. Now, the question is, how she sees that information is going to be the telling thing. She could see 
yes, somewhere in there it says kidnap blessed child. That's all she sees. That at some point he thought kidnap blessed child. And that's enough for her to say, yeah, he's he could be planning on, he has planned at some point to kidnap me. Or can she see that he was thinking about it, but no longer cares to? Then she can honestly say, yeah, he, she won't say it, but she will think, yeah, he was planning on it, but he's not anymore. He's clear. But again, to my point that I made earlier, I think she'll see it and go, nope, I don't see any of that. He's not planning on kidnapping me. Even if she sees that he is planning on it, because again, I think she'd be perfectly fine with it. If it will help out Rudius, the husband of Edis, I don't really care. It doesn't seem like he wants to kill me. I'll let him do it. But again, that all assumes that she's not some clever mastermind or something. It, again, it implies that she is just basically a tool locked up all the time, let out to, they, they, they take her out for walkies every now and then. All right, blessed child, it's your day for your walkies. Oh, goody, ruff, ruff. And they just put the collar on her and just walk her out there. And all the guys going, oh, what a cute puppy the whole entire time. So I don't know. It, it doesn't imply that she's some mastermind that is the secret plotter behind it all. So I think that she being a tool, wanting to help Rudius, she'd be fine with it. She wouldn't rat him out. But again, I think the, the trouble this is going to cause is the suspicion's already there. And I think Rudius is going to be pretty ticked off about that. Because one, this could ruin some trust that Therese has of him, even if it is found that he's not at fault here. But two, Rudius is going to very quickly realize, who did I tell that to? Did the blessed child see it in my mind? And that he might come to that conclusion. The blessed child may have actually seen it. But then he's going to start questioning Aisha, Geese, Cliff, Pope. Four individuals that know that I was going to do that. Which one? Pope. I think it's an easy answer for him too. I think he'll keep Geese in that mind, but it's got to be Pope. Yes, I mean, obviously the other thing here is that the man god could have told anybody and those people could have told Therese that. Could have told Therese. Therese could have had a dream last night. Rudius is going to kidnap the blessed child. You better inquisition him or you'll regret it. That's a possibility too. And that does lead into my theories around Therese overall. I don't want it to be the case. I don't want Therese to be manipulated in some way, but there's a chance for anybody to be manipulated, honestly. She could have been manipulated to be telling Rudius all this information about Claire and about wanting to get the family together to stay him off. And yes, could have been told that Rudius is after the blessed child. I don't want that though. There is a side of me that's kind of blown away that Rudius would be willing to walk right into a trap. You would think that he would be a lot more, a lot more safe about this kind of stuff. I mean, I, walking up to the easel with a candle sitting on top of it, I don't know what the candle's for, but Damn, why would you do that? It seems obviously suspicious. But again, he's been going there every single day. Things seem pretty chill. It's supposed to be a safe area. I don't see why he would be on caution. But, I mean, Temple Knights have tried to kill him before. And yes, he's got to deal with the man god manipulating people on a constant basis. Why would he not be more uh, cautious about this stuff? But yeah, the country of barrier magics is going to be a constant thing he's going to be running into. I'd be curious if he has anything that he can utilize that doesn't require mana. Did I cover everything? Really good set of chapters. I think it's been a really long recording. Not too bad a recording. But yeah, it was a, a good set of chapters. Again, kind of sucks that we didn't get the... Zenith isn't safe yet. <laughs> and uh, sorry to leave it on a cliffhanger. I, I, I'm, I'm getting good at the uh, cliffhangers. Cliff Grimoire hangers. Uh, Cliff Grimoire emotes hangers in the chat. Um, but I, I don't know. It's, it's one of those cases where you can end up running into every chapter and it ends on a cliffhanger, depending on where we're at with the story. Sometimes that can kind of happen. So anyways, looking forward to chapter three, the, the, the flip the board and take the king, which is kind of a, a very ominous, very ominous title, by the way. Take the king. Question mark. Anyways, uh, We'll see where it goes from here, but I appreciate you guys dropping by for the premiere. Hey, chat. Hope you guys are doing well. Hopefully, you guys kept your mouth shut this week. Chatters have been bad for the last few weeks, and it's like, dang, I didn't think that we were getting that crazy with the theories going on, and or at least things that people don't want to not talk about. <laughs> but de definitely appreciate the mods for keeping the chat clean. Definitely take a moment, shout them out, 
Adrian Earthly. Thank them for their service. And I really greatly appreciate their service. It means a great deal to me. But yeah, I greatly appreciate everybody for their support, their kind words, for dropping by for the premiere, for dropping by for the VOD later on, for spreading the word, telling people about Mexico Monday. All that stuff means a great deal to me. And yes, greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate everybody that supports the channel monetarily through Patreon, tips, links, super thanks, memberships, all that stuff. It means a great deal to me. And until the next Mexico Monday, which hopefully Zenith will be safe in, Y'all take care. They arrived in the Vistas. They arrived. Wow, great start, Andrew. Woohoo! First line. When Laplace began its war, when 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 had married had married the Marcus of Bach, of Burkant of of Burkant, Burkrant. All those memories just 